please. Uh, Brandon, you can see my screen. This meeting is being recorded. Yeah, we see it perfectly well. Uh, or Alice, can you confirm that you can see the Android tablet screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to remind you, uh, Breno showed the, the access to the sandbox uh, on Monday morning. So what I'm showing is our, our sandbox that is publicly available on the web portal, but also you can download the native DHIS2 capture app and then connect to this uh, URL to explore all the features that we're demonstrating this week. I'm cheating a bit because I'm using the sandbox uh, development so that we can do some uh, configuration, but it's basically the sandbox that you have access to is basically a copy of what you are showing today. So I'm going to show what we call the biomedical equipment lifecycle management uh, tool. Um, and uh, then I will show briefly the analytics. And finally, we'll have a short uh, under the hood session on the, on the tracker program in case you have any questions how this is configured. Um, so we call it uh, lifecycle management. Uh, we realize that there's a lot of need for cold chain um, equipment management. So refrigerators and freezers, that's often the burning issue um, and probably the most uh, widely used at the facility level but biomedical equipment is a huge field um, and there's a very wide range of equipment that needs to be managed. And there's also uh, academic studies. So it is known that there is a lot of a very high percentage of equipment that is um, available in healthcare facilities, but which is not used because it is not functional, it's not maintained. And it's very difficult to manage all this equipment uh, without, without sharing the information on the functional status with the uh, technicians and the biomedical engineers. So that's basically the, the idea that you are replacing a paper record if you have an asset register or you have a kind of um, system with um, cards for each of the pieces of equipment on paper. That are, main, that are maintained for recording all the repairs and uh, the, the maintenance, but this cannot be easily shared with the, with the technician and therefore the, the use is limited. So again, what we're doing is, is quite simple. It's quite basic, but um, uh, sharing the information from the facility level throughout the entire country to, uh, to all those people who should have access is, is uh, of course, a huge improvement in terms of management. So it's biomedical equipment lifecycle management for those experts of DHS2. You can see that there's a due date and I have not synchronized my data, um, which I'll do later. So the first screen that you see is already kind of the first application. So there's actually two tools in one. And the first one is what you see here. This is like an asset register. Uh, yeah, it's scrolling on. So you can see this is the uh, Mahasot um, uh, a clinic, and you can see a list of all the equipment. So you have a, a pulse, uh, this is actually another clinic, but you have a pulse exhumate, you have a refrigerator, cold box, different cold boxes actually here. Um, but you also have um, a patient monitor and uh, uh, suction machines or any kind of equipment. Uh, the, the specifications for refrigerators and freezers will be of course specific to cold chain equipment, but in principle, um, it, the tool can be customized for any kind of biomedical equipment. Even in principle, you could use it for other kind of equipment. So if you wanted to use it for generator sets or water pumps or other equipment you could in principle uh, modify it. So this is basically the asset register that is then also accessible to anybody else who has access uh, to the tool, either on the mobile device or on the web portal. Um, so you have here a list of attributes that can be freely configured. Of course, this will is adjusted actually um, Actually, it's no. Actually, it's generic, so you can 
uh, but again you can uh, this is just a track to, uh, this is just an attribute so you can easily change the these attributes you can add you can remove you can change the order very easily so you can you have here where it is installed you can see the manufacturer the brand name you see the the details uh, you can record the serial number um, who has provided it you could record the warranty expiry date if that is uh, if that is available and you see this is very nice you have also a picture and that is extremely useful because uh, chances are that you have different pulse oximeters in larger facilities different refrigerators and uh, sometimes you have similar models so it's not clear it might not be obvious what is what so you can enlarge and you can see then the picture of of the equipment so this is already kind of the the, the first uh, use case having a centralized uh, a digital asset register that can be uh, managed you can control the user access so you can define who has the user rights to add equipment to remove equipment or to remove the specifications of equipment so again dhis tool natively has a very um, sophisticated user management tool which allows uh, to give uh, view and edit access to the uh, different functions so uh, I already mentioned that you might have several different uh, pieces of equipment. So typically refrigerators, uh, you might have one or two, but you might have also several. And uh, of course, if you are going to record um, any information on inspection or on maintenance, you want to make sure that you are recording that information for the right piece of equipment. And uh, some of the inspections you might do it every day or every week and uh, this might be a frequent job so you might uh, you could easily inadvertently be clicking the wrong item so what you can do is you can uh, furnish each piece of equipment with its own uh, barcode or it could be a qr code or uh, even a gs1 data matrix code but the easiest is to use a linear barcode that um, with encoded uh, unique identifier. So this is one of the, of the attributes that are um, indicated here. You have here the unique identification. So I'm going to do that just for demonstration purposes. So I have what you're showing, what you're seeing is my, is my tablet PC, right? Um, so let's say I want to record uh, an inspection or a weekly, um, preventive maintenance for my refrigerator and I want to be sure that I'm selecting the right one, then I will uh, attach a label to that refrigerator. And you can see here uh, the unique identifier. You see here, this is actually a symbol for a QR code, but it stands for any kind of barcode. So I'm going to select it. And uh, on my screen, on my PowerPoint, I have opened the the barcode on the side i'm not going to switch my screen just to show you that you can imagine it's just a barcode that is attached to your refrigerator and then just put it down again and then i'm going to click on the search button and you see that it is going to bring up this refrigerator so now i'm sure that i'm entering the data in the right the right refrigerator okay but i have uh, prepared a little scenario so i'm going to use uh, another piece of equipment for um, for the demonstration purposes. So if you have any questions or comments, just jump in. So I'm just going to preparing something. OK, so what I have done is I have um, basically to demonstrate how you would use this on a day to day basis. I have selected the pulse oximeter and I'm going to open this. I, I don't have such a fancy uh, pulse oximeter, but anyway, I have a little one. So to show you, this is basically just to keep it practical. Um, so, so see, I have a pulse and you can see a pulse oximeter. So let's imagine that I'm a, a, I'm a nurse in, in um, outpatient department or in an emergency room and one of the tasks you have is that when you take over your shift you're supposed to check your equipment so you make sure that everything is working if it is needed and um, so 
why we call it life cycle management is uh, basically we reflect the entire life of the piece of equipment from, I will explain the transfer later, from the installation. Then inspection is basically the daily, weekly, monthly checks. Then the preventive maintenance, like cleaning, uh, checking the gasket, whatever is required for the equipment. Then for cold chain equipment, also other equipment, there's a WHO requirement that you should record and document all the alarms, the reasons how it was resolved to have a complete record. Then if the equipment needs repair, then you can make a repair request. Then if uh, the next step is then for a technician and engineer, biomedical engineer, to carry out the corrective maintenance, also called repairs. And if the repair is successful, you continue the cycle. If the repair is not uh, um, possible, then you dispose of the equipment. So you get a, com a complete record of every piece of equipment that is then also digitally archived. So I'm going to start with the installation and I'm going to spare you the agony to watch me type on a little, on a little screen. So what I have done is I have basically entered the scenario already. Let me just see how I can show this best way. And maybe like this, so. Um, so let's say the equipment is in, uh, the equipment is installed for the first time, so delivered to the facility. So you can write a short report. Uh, you will normally test the equipment. Uh, you will check where the alarms are working. You will uh, brief the staff and you will hand over the user documentation. So that's what you would uh, typically do um, to document the installation so that you know who has installed it, when was it installed. And just to mention that for everything that I'm showing today, you will see one or two windows only. That is because we have no um, standard document on what should be reported, but this is also fully, uh, this is all fully customizable. And you can add um, these questions that need to be filled in um, um, as, as required, right? So Brenner and myself, we are not uh, biomedical engineer, so we will rely on a subject matter expert in the respective country or project to, uh, to advise on what is required. Then for an inspection, very simple. Um, let's say you're just checking whether your pulse oximeter is working or your refrigerator is working, temperature is, and you have different ways you would just uh, enter this shortly. And then maybe for those who are not so familiar with, uh, with the tracker programs yet, so how this would work, let's say um, I have, you can see these uh, entries are from, from June. And let's say I'm going to do the functional check today. Uh, I don't want to, no, no, no sorry. Um, inspection, I should click on the plus here and I'm going to add a new inspection. And that's going to open the window and it will say to this, um, by default show today's date, I'm in Mahasot Clinic, I click on next. And then it says uh, um, inspection report and then you will write whatever uh, you need to write. Uh, obviously on the tablet, you don't want to have too long text, but basically the fact that you have confirmed, uh, I deleted again, okay. Uh, that you have done the inspection is kind of sufficient and you will also have the record of the name and the date and the timestamp so you know that um, that equipment was checked. And then you save it and that's basically all you need to do. So, oops, that was too fast. Okay, maybe I should stick with using only the tablet or the screen. Okay, but you can see that you have, I have successfully entered uh, for today, the inspection report. So that's basically how it works, very simple. Again, we don't want to burden the health workers with uh, a lot of work. It should be simple, easy to use. Um, then um, the preventive maintenance, let's say I would have recorded um, routine servicing according to the service manual, um, uh, checked alarms, calibrated sensor, so whatever is uh, required, clean the equipment. You can have a record with a date and a time. And then uh, let's say I have an alarm. So my oxygen concentrate, sorry, the pulse oximeter is prompting an alarm. 
and um, okay, just. Oh, I think the screen is cut off at the bottom. I don't know if I can change that. But you can see that um, alarm type, you can see audible alarm. So maybe I should show that because it's important. You don't have to type everything. You can also use various uh, drop down menus. Yeah, indeed. I don't know if you can see the whole screen. It's cut on my screen. So I'll go to next and um, you see here, if I click on alarm type, you have different drop downs. So I could say this was an audible or visual alarm. And um, here you have free text entries. And then if the, whether the alarm was resolved, then you can just select from the drop down menu. And if the alarm was resolved, you're not informing your supervisor. So that is obviously much easier on a mobile device to just select from a menu. And again, these menus are fully customizable. So instead of having yes, no, you can have any kind of text. You can have many, several of the of the of the options, whatever is required. So uh, it's a native uh, tracker program, very versatile. I'm not going to save this now. Um, and just go back. So the repair request uh, is straightforward. Um, actually, I'm going to show that in the next scenario. Okay, you have any questions or comments so far? I have two more short scenarios. So anything Brenda wants to add, otherwise I'll move on. Okay, so I showed basically the happy path. You check, you install the equipment, you check it. Alarms are resolved, everything is working, so no need for any intervention. Now we have again equipment that was installed. Um, preventive maintenance was done and now I have an alarm. Um, so alarm type audible alarm replaced battery and the issue was resolved and no need to escalate to the to the supervisor. But then um, yeah. So then I have another, um, I have a repair request. Let's imagine I have an, a pulse oximeter that is not working like this one. You can see that I'm not able to switch it on. Um, so it says the LCD display is flickering and you can enter the urgency of the repair request. It's unusable, but it's needed. And uh, this is kind of um, a huge improvement because you have a digital record as soon as you synchronize your mobile device the technician uh, using a mobile device or behind the desktop computer can also see that the repair request has been launched, um, you know, find it on our map. So no need basically to send urgent SMS to call. You could have it basically a digital um, record. And then the next step um, would be for the biomedical engineer um, <clears throat> to um, intervene. So here you have assessment of the technical fault. So they've identified that there was just a loose contact, solved with the loose contact, the technical fault was resolved and the equipment restored to service and everything is fine again. The equipment is working again. And again, you have a complete record from the inspection, the alarm, the fault found by the health worker, the request and the corrective maintenance. So the very last uh, short scenario, that I'm going to show is if that is not successful. So I will not go through everything again, but just to demonstrate kind of the practicality of how this uh, would work in real life. So again, you have pulse oximeter. Um, so this morning was not, uh, pulse oximeter was not switching on, change the battery, that didn't help. So that's good to provide some information. So the technician is not going to the clinic for something that is trivial. Um, urgency is medium as there's a backup equipment. So you have seen I have two pieces, so one is working, so it's okay, but still needed, still essential. Then you have the corrective maintenance. So that's the repair of the biomedical engineer. So um, basically you can have a short repair report, uh, assessment report of what was checked um, and the uh, conclusion is that the equipment cannot be repaired and has to therefore be decommissioned. So it was not restored um, back to service 
and the uh, technical fault was not resolved. So, by the way, this yes, no questions or false um, correct are not only easy to fill in, but they're also really useful when you have a line listing report that we'll show in a minute, because you can just filter, show me all the equipment where the technical fault was not resolved. And then the final step in this case, because the equipment could not be restored, um, you're going to um, decommission it and uh, show, write a short report what was done with it. Maybe you can use the replacement parts uh, or you have to destroy it. And then you should remove it from your equipment uh, inventory, so from this list, so that it's no longer uh, appears on your list. And you have, an, again, an updated list of the equipment that is actually in use at your facility. Okay, um, are there any questions or comments? Uh, George, there was a question, um, and I don't know if it's uh, possible to to demo that now, but the enrollment of devices and assets, uh, first are they first previously done in a separate tracker program, or is it all done within the same biomedical equipment lifecycle management program? Good question. So uh, it's it's done in the same in the same tracker program on the web portal that I'll show in a minute. Okay, if there's no other questions on on the the mobile application, I'll switch my screen and show the line listing. Yeah, I just wanted to mention. Uh, um, I'm just taking my notes. Um, so the the functions, the options that you have for entering are, are text, numbers, dates. Uh, also, you can record the geolocation if you need to do that. And one important feature that I have not shown is that you can also take pictures. So in the repair request, you take a picture of the fault and uh, attach it to DHIS2. And this is visible to the technician anywhere in the country. Uh, I'm just cautioning because, of course, that takes a lot of storage space. You have to synchronize the device, so it should be used with caution, but in principle, that, that is possible. Okay, then I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go to the DHS2 web portal. Let's see. Make sure that I share my right window. I think it's this one. And I'll have, okay. I don't know if this works. Um, Brandon, can you see a line listing report? There's nothing on screen yet, no. There's no, no screen. Nothing yet. on screen. Okay, okay, it didn't work. Okay, try again. Share my screen window. Oh, that's not. Okay, trying again. Okay, it says I'm sharing my screen. We now see it, George. Now it's good. Okay. Uh, Renny, you, do you want me to show the enrollment, how that works? Registration? Maybe we can do that at the end, just if you... Okay. Can you have another general question as well? We can take up later. Yeah. So the first uh, feature I want to show is the, the transfer. So transfer of equipment that was uh, a use case that was uh, requested. So we don't have a native functionality for this yet, but uh, we are requesting this is a use case to the bulk transfer, but we have a workaround. So you can see that um, this uh, uh, pulse oximeter here um, was transferred, was sent from Mahasot Clinic and it was transferred to Mitahab Clinic. So it's, uh, you can have the date and all the other um, details. I'm just showing like the essentials. And then when that piece of equipment arrives at uh, Mitahab uh, Clinic, you can also re say received from uh, Mahasot Clinic and received at. So. It's a workaround, it's not perfect, but you do have a record if you move a refrigerator or any other piece of clean uh, equipment from one clinic to, to another, you have a digital record of who 
uh, transfer it, the date and time, and you could also have, if you wanted to transfer report, why you did that. So that's already quite quite good compared to a paper solution. Um, I will not go um, through this in detail. You can imagine that for each of the stages that you have seen, you can have a report. So if the technician or the manager of the clinic or a health worker wanted to see a record of all the inspection reports, or you wanted to check whether that inspection is done, you can have a dashboard here. So for those who are not familiar yet, line listing is really a wonderful addition to DHIS2, very powerful and uh, really very beautifully designed. So uh, use it. Um, and uh, I, I will briefly show you have then the maintenance report, preventive maintenance report. So as a technician, if I had a technical fault, I could go through all the maintenance reports of a specific piece of equipment for a clinic and view them. Of course, here, um, I don't have time to show all the details of what you can do here. You can have a filter, so you can uh, filter only for one piece of uh, equipment. Um, then you have a report on the corrective maintenance, so you would have a complete record of all the equipment maintenance done in a district or even a country by the uh, technician, biomedical engineer, cold chain technician on one digital record. And again, of course, you can uh, sort or filter for different organization units, uh, facilities. You can, you can sort or filter by the department, by date, by equipment, anything that you can imagine. Um, very powerful also to have all these filters for each of the, of the headers. Um, yeah. And uh, then you have the, oh, did I duplicate? Sorry, that was already a corrective maintenance report. And then the disposal report. And uh, again, the report on the disposal. And um, as I mentioned, you can have, if you have yes, no questions, then you can easily filter for them or sort them and have, if you just want to um, look at all the equipment that was not received, removed or that was not answered. Okay, I think um, we can take some, uh, some questions that completes the demo on the analytics. We can take some question maybe before very briefly discussing what is under the hood. George, I think Alex Watila, or oh, I see Alex, you have your hand up if you want to ask the question you had in the chat. That's perfect for now. Go ahead, Alex. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so one use case that comes, especially with donated uh, equipment, is that uh, the donor requires some kind of audit or verification. So like, was the equipment delivered to the facility? Is it still in the facility? Was it entered into the government asset uh, register? Can uh, this functionality assist with that? So I think you could, um, if you had a list of the equipment, you could filter by it if it is identifiable with the equipment model, maybe a unique identifier. And uh, you could have a list at the national level um, where all of this equipment uh, currently is in place. And uh, it's a very good idea. So the donor could even see whether that equipment, uh, regular preventive maintenance is carried out um, and, and the equipment is, uh, the inspection is done and so on. So we would have, if it would be interesting if you could share with us the exact use case and we study the details, but as I would, think that uh, partially um, it would be extremely helpful. Again, anybody can have access to this record, so no need to send any paper records or paper reports from all the facilities. In principle, anybody who has access to the DHIS2 server uh, is authorized and is giving uh, credentials um, could view this kind of information. Okay, do we have any other questions? I think that was a great answer, George, because I had answered it in writing in Slack, and I think uh, it was uh, the same as you just said. So I think that that was great, uh, great coordination uh, by us. I think the other questions were a comment from Nora saying that the transfer report is great as it holds the history of the device. Um, and then I have a question now from Robert Modi. Um, 
The reports are great. One data item that would be great to add to the biomedical equipment lifecycle reports, if not already in, is the warranty validity. Yeah, great point. Um, so the warranty is, the, I called it the warranty expiry date. It's part of the attributes. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the we have included it, but uh, again, I, we call it warranty expiry date, right? So you could have, uh, you could of course rename that. that. That is a possibility, definitely. I think it's a good idea. You could also add as an attribute the, the contact uh, company uh, person um, who holds the warranty and who can be uh, contacted. One other thing that you could do again with caution is that you, you can attach PDF files to um, like upload a file. Uh, that can be quite heavy then of course on the synchronization, but in principle, if you had any kind of uh, user instructions or warranty uh, documentations or, or any other documentation that is relevant, you could also add it um, directly to the tracker program. Any other questions? I think that was it, unless there are any hands. No, I think that's it. There was the okay. point on the internet. I don't know if we're gonna go back to that. Yeah, so you can see uh, um, registration screen, uh, Breno. Yeah, we see that. Yeah, okay, so basically uh, you can go on, on the web portal and you can register piece, a new piece of equipment. So you see my household clinic, you have the enrollment date. Uh, so let's say if you have a new refrigerator delivered, um, let's say uh, probably to the central warehouse that is then going to inspect it and deliver it. Uh, enter unique, so just basically enter all the, the attributes and click on save and it is added to, the, to your um, asset register. So very simple to do. And maybe related to that, I can also um, okay, I will go back also to mention that, uh, of course, you can edit this uh, asset register. So let's say uh, I registered a piece of equipment, but I found that I make mistake. And you can again go on the tracker or on the uh, uh, event uh, on the capture um, app, and you can all these fields are now editable, and you can you can change it. Let's say you forgot to enter the product number. And I'm going to now type uh, that product number to complete the registration. So very flexible to do. Of course, you should make sure that the editing rights are limited so that only authorized people um, are editing the, this record. Okay, I think that um, concludes the presentation. Let's ask questions. So we do a quick under the hood. For those who are familiar, um, who want to know how this is configured, again, quite uh, simple. Yeah, I think we can continue, George. No more questions for now. Yeah, okay. I'm opening the, the maintenance. So I'm going to go on the program. Again, I'm not a specialist, so you might detect something that can be done better. Um, but again, for that, we have the expertise of the HIS group who can who do that. Um, configuration for living. So I have here the biomedical equipment lifecycle management. It is a tracker program, right? So you have tracker and event programs. This is a tracker program because you have repeatable events. And as I mentioned, you you want to keep you want to keep a complete record of the equipment maybe over many years. So you just give it a name. I think there's not much here to uh, configure also if not on here. Um, so attributes, this is important. So here you have basically the, the attributes that you have seen on the, let's say the, the asset um, list screen that you can configure. So you have the, the unique identifier so that it's on the top of the screen. And when you are scanning for the barcode, uh, you don't have to look in the list. It's always, uh, it's going to be all the way on the, on the top. And this is fully customizable, so you can create, you can see, you can just, I will not save it, but it's very easy to remove or to add. Let's say if I wanted to have uh, 
uh, add the image of the equipment to my list. I could just put product image, add it to the right. And that would add it to the list. And then if I wanted to move, uh, we talked about warranty, you move this up or down, you can also do that. So you have complete control of um, the order of the items. You can also then uh, decide whether all of them are searchable or not. Maybe you don't want to have a long list for the search, but just have a unique identifying type of equipment. Um, and just if you have a, for the unique identifier, if you're using a barcode, QR code, GS1, just make sure to configure this as a QR code so that you have the icon and then uh, DHS2 can read it as a barcode. The registration form basically comes up, uh, yeah, is kind of the same order, but you can, again, you can customize it. So that's all there is actually on that. Um, then the program stages, as you have seen, again, fully customizable. You can also move them up and down if you want to change the order. You can add, you can uh, remove some. There's quite a few, so that might be already too complicated. Maybe good for hospital, maybe too extensive for, uh, for a small clinic if you just want to manage uh, one or two refrigerators. And uh, within the program stages, let's say if I go to alarms, uh, it's repeatable, right? So except the disposal is only done once, the installation might be done in several places. So that's why it's all re also repeatable. And then the important point is to assign date elements. So basically have attributes. Those are appearing on the home screen. And then for the individual questions that you want to appear on the questionnaire, you have to create a data element for each of those, very simple. You go on the data element tab, you create new, just make sure that you create it for tracker, not aggregate, otherwise it won't appear. And then it will appear on this list and you can just add and remove them very easily. And again, you can have um, text, yes, no. Um, you can also in the data element, you can use an option set um, for, for having several options. Uh, in a drop down menu. Um, maybe I will show that briefly afterwards. So, again, you can add, remove. You can, um, yeah, I think they also always appear in alphabetical order, but you can, you can change the order actually. And then you have the data entry form and, uh, to, to display um, the order in which those items are appearing right in the screen. I'm not going to save any of that. I think that's basically it. That's the program stages. And then you have the access that's basically uh, just giving access for which uh, organization unit it applies and the notifications um, if you want. we are working on that. Uh, maybe actually to mention that we are also thinking of expanding the functionality to have a maintenance report uh, with notifications. So we hope to use this for the, um, have this available with the bulk load. So you could already um, create an event uh, separately for uh, maintenance. For example, if the technician had an instruction to uh, replace a part or to carry out any specific uh, maintenance, um, but that will be cumbersome if you have many um, pieces of equipment. So we think that with the bulk load, that will be an option to just upload uh, weekly, monthly maintenance. And the great thing about that is that <clears throat> the respective person, the technician or the healthcare worker then will receive a notification in DHIS to please carry out weekly or monthly uh, maintenance. So that's uh, one of the future use cases. I'm going to check. Uh, I think I might have an option set that I can show for um, drop down options. Yeah. Yes, audio, audible, visible alarm. So if you have, I have demonstrated that briefly, right? So you just have a yes, no question. So I should check the alarm type. Sorry for the clicking so much. So what you can do here is you have a data element, which is called alarm type, which is appearing in the stage. 
And now I want the user, in, so to prevent them or avoid that they have to retype every time, I'm going to create this kind of, of drop down menu where they just select it was an audible or visual alarm, or this is in future for the cold chain app that they received a notification through uh, DHIS2. And you can uh, easily modify, um, edit, um, or add options to this list. So even if you're not a DHIS2 expert, this is very easy. Um, to customize, but again, the details of a tracker program are quite intricate, so we do recommend using a HISP group. Okay, I'm just going to check my notes if I covered everything. Otherwise, do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, a last thing that we're actually currently working on in the functional design working group. Uh, so you might be asking if I have, um, I'm going to go back to my, uh, if I, um, you might be wondering, so you have a list of equipment and to have um, inspection arms, prevent corrective maintenance, which will be quite different between a refrigerator and an X-ray machine or pulse oximeter. And you would like to be able to differentiate the tracker program for each of those equipment. So you see like a pulse oximeter suction machine are quite different. So we are working on the hoping to provide in future next year, sometimes the option that you could customize the questionnaires depending on the piece of equipment. So DHIS2 would automatically, when you, when you register and open a, a pulse oximeter, you would have um, a customized list of, um, for the inspection and the preventive maintenance. While if you open um, a, a, for a refrigerator, you would have another um, if you own a refrigerator, you would have another list of inspections and preventive maintenance. So that would be quite an improvement because now you have basically one checklist that applies to each and every uh, piece of equipment. So you could also, you could already do that today with program rules, but it's a bit fiddly because you would have to hide certain stages or data elements and that's kind of just takes a lot of program rules, although technically it is possible. Okay, I checked my notes. So I think I have covered everything I wanted to cover. I don't know, Brandon, do you want to mention the work we have been doing with uh, with UNICEF on this? And the HISP Malawi, actually? Sure, of course. And uh, we had uh, in the annual conference this year, we had Malawi also presenting uh, this type of configuration for managing cold chain equipment. And that's the similar dialogue that we're currently uh, uh, in with UNICEF to develop this kind of um, configuration, uh, meeting certain requirements, similar to what Alex's question was related to the auditor, uh, to the audit questions uh, from specific donors that they have specific requirements. So this would be specific to cold chain equipment inventory management. Uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a wave of uh, equipment and uh, um, uh, ultra cold chain equipment that was sent to countries. And there was a, a influx of equipment that now needs to be managed, repurposed and, and maintained. So uh, that's one of the driving factors among others to have a tool that is able to then uh, uh, capture and follow all of these different uh, uh, operational stages from uh, start to end of life for cold chain equipment um, inventory. So this is something that we hope to have finalized soon, that we have something that's in line with the UNICEF requirements, that's in line with uh, existing standards and practice. Um, some of that too, George, uh, I'm not sure if you maybe touched on it, but the ability to connect this to the PQS, so having this data being uh, populated once uh, equipment is enrolled and, and ensuring that uh, this data is available there as well. Um, and not all of that happens within DHIS2. There's also some dependencies on, on other uh, systems and other data sources, like the PQS catalog is not something that we would uh, host by any means. That's a, a separate uh, uh, discussion or a separate uh, 
uh, data source, but uh, the point being that we would then develop a tool that can be implemented across countries and immediately meeting uh, certain standards. It's the principle behind uh, the, the, the disease packages, like you may have seen it for, for HIV, TB, malaria for disease, uh, um, surveillance and case management. Now, this is a similar approach. It's not, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, the, the same implementation, but it's simply having a configuration that meets some donor requirements and some industry standards for management reporting and so on of this equipment. So that is very specific to cold chain equipment, but it's the same, uh, similar functions uh, as you see here, similar reporting and, and similar kind of data. I think that's what we can say. I can also maybe mention, and as I, I think I put this in the chat, I'll, I'll elaborate a bit more on the Friday morning session that we've presented this to um, a lot of the donors. I think all of the major donors are aware of this. So all the ones that are working with DHS2, which is yeah, uh, most of the major ones, just about every major one. So um, uh, of the global donors, and we've presented this as a tool uh, that can support cold chain equipment inventory. And Gavi specifically has already included this as part of their uh, uh, funding for country uh, level uh, assistance or so technical assistance. So to actually conduct an assessment and consider the implementation of this kind of tool, um, it may not cover a full national scale implementation, but it would definitely be able to launch, conduct an assessment and, and have a project startup coordinate with stakeholders, and then uh, make sure there's a proper requirement gathering and developing a proper implementation plan. So for a pre-project, it should be sufficient to cover uh, the consideration for, for, for this kind of implementation. And then I'll go through a bit more details on Friday that because that has to be done through contacts with country uh, contacts and so on and, and uh, different considerations on, on budgeting. That's, again, beyond our scope and engagement, but it's something that's already been uh, uh, communicated, accepted, supported, and now, in a sense, budgeted for uh, through the Gavi uh, TCA uh, uh, contracts. So, um, yes, that is, I think, what I can say about that. You have the configuration. I just have a... Yeah, just a short comment, because if I understood the uh, question correctly from Jose, that was a request. So just to mention that uh, we have uh, mentioned several times, uh, Breno, that we have the sandbox, you have access, but we also have this configuration guide. Um, needs a bit of updating, but this is quite up to date that you can find on the, on the DHS2 website and download it as a PDF document. Uh, you will need some um, DHS2 expertise, but it gives a short overview of the use case and it does give a configuration. So if you had uh, even an empty database and you wanted to configure the aggregate data entry form, you could basically follow here. It tells you these are the category options, create them, create this category uh, and so on, data elements, data set. So it's a very short summary. Um, but it, it is comprehensive and it does list hopefully all of the settings that are needed and you also have that for the for the tracker programs. All right, I don't see that we have any more immediate questions you have there. Thank you from Kose. Uh, but yeah, so you have the, the demo site, the, the sandbox, you have the, um, the configuration guide available on the website. Uh, we have this work with different uh, donors and partners to align the requirements so it can be used for biomedical equipment or cold chain equipment. Um, a lot of this can be configured um, and it can be uh, adapted to specific needs. I think this is again, similar to Alex's question on the requirements for the donor audit. So at the time of implementation, a lot of these different things can be changed. Uh, new question from Abdel, if there's a French translation, I don't think we have a French translation yet, but it may be something we work on again with this UNICEF work and maybe that they require the French translation. What I believe we have actually is a Portuguese translation because it may have been already uh, done by the team, the HISP Mozambique team. So we, I think we have it in Portuguese, but French would be something that needs to be worked on. So the, the, the standard uh, uh, DHIS2 
components are translated, but not the specific uh, biomedical equipment. Uh, 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 yeah. My thinking is that if you are working in a francophone country, probably you only need the French version. So I could suggest that you then configure um, the, the tracker program in French. And of course, DHIS2, as Brenna said, comes natively in, uh, in dozens of languages. Yeah. So only the specific and maybe, biomedical equipment content, so the stages that would need to be translated, but not the other additional DHS2 native. Exactly. Uh, and just an idea for Alex on the reporting, great idea on the donor reporting. Uh, you could even consider having, let's say, a dedicated report that the donor can just open, view access only, and customize it to their needs so that you don't have to like uh, create manual reports. So I think uh, Breno is a world champion in being on time. So maybe we just go for the break. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to uh, to respect uh, uh, people's time and, and that we stick to that. But if we've covered all of the different points, uh, if there are no more questions, if there's no more uh, um, anything more you're, you're, you want to know about this, I think uh, it's there. Use it, share it, share it with your team, share it with others. Um, either through the, uh, the, the written guide. Uh, again, the recording will be available later in the day on the YouTube channel uh, and just to share and promote this. And then if you have any feedback as well as uh, we already got some for how this can be improved, how it can be changed, uh, let us know. We're always happy to hear from you. But I think good recommendation, George, if we take the break now. Uh, so my local time here is 11.17. We can come back at 11.45, all right? So quarter two, we can come back and continue with the temperature monitoring tool and some of the work we've done there, all right? And then we'll finalize. And then we'll finalize with question and answer and how this may be applicable also for your, uh, for your cases. So I think we'll start there. Quick comment, sorry, Philip, before I hand over to you that I did post in the questions channel on Slack, I posted a summary of the different points from this morning's menti. I know uh, some of the questions were somewhat ambiguous. It may have been difficult to answer the, the right answer. So then I just made a summary of the points we wanted to communicate and get across to everybody. If something's still unclear, uh, comment there and we can, we can have a discussion and we can uh, make it uh, so it's perfectly clear for everybody, all right? So now I'll hand over to Philip. Welcome again. Um, and he'll present, and then we can uh, we can continue with some of the development path for this tool. But over to you, Philip. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I'll just do you see my screen now. Yes, we see that. Yeah. So hi everybody. My name is uh, Philip Larsen. I'm a former master student, and uh, I'm going to present uh, my thesis, which is uh, the cold chain monitoring app. Uh, it's a sen sensor-based cold chain monitoring uh, system using the DJIS2 tracker capture app. So I was uh, so fortunate to pilot this project. Um, the thesis was uh, given to me by George and Breno and Johan, and uh, we started working on the concept and uh, made a minimal viable product. Uh, which we tested in Sambesa, in a province in Mozambique, uh, which, with some objectives of uh, implementing the application at four health facilities, providing the facility workers with tablets uh, so they could use the application, and training the health workers in using it. And the goal was to digitize a manual temperature uh, reading process, which is today paper-based. So on the on the right side, you see a picture of us uh, and uh, the facility workers conducting a polar campaign in uh, Sambesa. Uh, and in the cooler box, you see the sensor we were using. And they were using the application to see uh, the temperature during the, the campaign and to verify that the vaccines that were given to the children were at the right temperature. Uh, so uh, what, what is the problem with the insufficient uh, cold chain monitoring? Uh, the most obvious is that people are vaccinated with vaccines that may be 
uh, unsafe due to insufficient temperature during storage and handling. So giving uh, giving uh, vaccines to or, or bad vaccines to children and patients. And as immunization program grows, the complexity increase and the need to strengthen components like cold chain and logistic management is critical to to make the immunization programs scalable. And the unit costs of uh, this is an example of uh, some other consequences. Uh, a unit cost of vaccines has increased from one US dollar per child in 2001 to about 28 in 2014. And I guess after COVID and other stuff, it's increased furthermore. So therefore, poor vaccine handling uh, can have significant financial consequences as well. So yeah, <clears throat> the goal was to improve temperature control with the cold chain monitoring application we have built. So in, on the first picture, you see the current cold chain monitoring system in, in uh, Sambesa which is a paper form representing one year. And the health facility workers uh, capture the temperature of the freezer uh, in the morning or the fridge in the morning and in the evening. And their work process is they take out all the vaccines uh, at, to a vaccination station. So actually the cold chain monitoring uh, of the vaccines are, uh, yeah, not so good so uh, and on the right side picture you see the application where uh, um, uh, so digitus implementer explains how to use it and we wanted to digitize the paper-based uh, solution by using the bluetooth sensors to monitor temperature and um, this provides for a more advanced uh, work process where you can bring the temperature sensors out to campaign works and to rural vaccinations and having uh, and verifying that the temperature is at the correct uh, temperature. And uh, using the application, it also prompts real-time alerts and provide historical data for analysis in DHIS2. As, the paper, uh, as collecting the data from the paper was uh, often not uh, digitized. So the technical solution of this, uh, this uh, application, it's using a Blue Maestro BLE temperature sensor, which has uh, at the picture on the right side with a battery lifetime of two years. And it's uh, low cost, estimated at 35 US dollar per device. And it's open access. So when you purchase it, you can use it. It's no subscription cost and additional costs afterwards. And it's possible to buy a full, uh, fully waterproof sensor, or you can buy a silicon uh, wrapper to make it fully waterproof. And over to the software, my contribution to this work. Um, it's a custom Android application using the Android SDK. And actually the bare bone of, it, of the application is the Skeleton app uh, provided by uh, DJI's two Android team. Uh, it sends data to the, to the tracker capture application and it has a local database, uh, which uh, so you don't lose any readings. It provides local alerts in form of a notification on the on the uh, Android device if the temperature are above or below a given threshold. It functions offline, giving you the possibility to capture temperatures and then upload it to the DJI's two instance when you have internet connectivity. And you can also export a CSV file uh, from the local database if you want to distribute the data or provide the data to other programs or non dhis 2 related uh, programs. So this is briefly the system architecture of the, of the solution. On the left side, you see the, the Bluetooth sensors and they advertise temperature data using Bluetooth low energy. And uh, in the middle there, there's the custom Android application, uh, which is integrated to, to the tracker app. And it uh, you can capture data from the from the Bluetooth sensors, 
And then when you have internet connectivity, you can upload it to a DHIS2 instance, and then decision makers can visualize and uh, act on the data collected. So now I'm going to give a quick uh, demo of the application. It's uh, to give you a brief, this is a minimal viable product. So uh, you sign into a, to a DJI's 2 instance and uh, grant access to location and Bluetooth. And then you're synchronizing metadata and data from DJI's 2. And then the Bluetooth sensors appears. You select one and you can uh, see the different te temperatures like current, min and max and average temperature and you can upload uh, a temperature to the application and then it gets stored in the local database and you can see that uh, you can see the battery time of the sensor and stuff like that and when you keep uploading the graph uh, view will update, update and it automatically listens to changes in temperature so uh, it it uh, gives you the option to yeah and you can see the database the local database uh, you can set a minimum and maximum threshold for the notification so if it's above or below the a notification will come on the on the android device uh, or be shown yeah and you can export the entire local database to a csv file uh, which i mentioned uh, so you can distribute the temperature readings and uh, yeah you can display the database and clear it if you want to start with a clean sheet so uh, after using the application for some time you can press upload data and then all the data will go into a tracked entity instance in the dhis2 uh, ecosystem and you can see the temperatures and aggregate uh, on the data you've collected. So that was the demo. Let's see. So the goal of uh, using such an application is to reduce the number of spoiled vaccines uh, through improving temperature control during storage and handling. And that will, again, uh, make it more safer to give you know that you give the right vaccines to the right people so don't so you don't, you don't vaccinate people with the spoiled vaccines and it can also uh, help reducing complexity by introducing support for cold chain monitoring integrated with the dji's 2 platform ecosystem so that you have one uh, vendor and the data goes directly into into the dji's 2 instance and it can also uh, increase the global health and immunization by reducing the number of spoiled vaccines with a cost-efficient cold chain mon monitoring application. And uh, furthermore, there's uh, a dedicated Android uh, developer is being recruited to work with this, and it's the uh, second priority for the HISP-LMIS team in Oslo. And I think uh, it was... Uh, uh, approximately April 2023, there will come some further development on this uh, subject. And uh, Mozambique is interested in expansion of the pilot, and the application will apply for a WHO performance quality safety pre qualification. And uh, yeah, that was uh, my presentation. And thank you so much. I want to thank George and Breno making this possible and uh, believing in uh, me. And a uh, big thanks to Sadigitus and the implementers. And uh, thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you for that, Philip. So this was um, a presentation then on this custom app that was built to connect uh, to the remote temperature monitor, so the Blue Maestro sensor. Uh, to collect uh, temperature data. So again, the, the functional use cases are really to collect alarms so that there's immediate corrective action being taken once temperatures are outside a threshold. And that would be coming through the, uh, the capture uh, mobile capture app, and then also to capture data and have it for the purpose of 
analytics, identifying where you have underperforming equipment, which maybe needs uh, uh, some action to, to correct or replace that equipment. So it's for the alarm purposes and also for the analytics and reporting purposes. All right. And this, of all the features that we present, and I had this already in day one when I presented the, uh, the, the set of features that we've developed for facility level management, this is the one that requires the most amount of, of, of development. It's the one where we've uh, implemented or, or, or ran this pilot and we had this MVP, uh, thanks to Philip who, who developed um, and gave us a very good starting point for continuing the work. So now it's one of the two uh, top priorities we have. Uh, together with a transactional based uh, uh, app to be able to have a functioning uh, integrated solution within the DHIS2 environment. So that's the objective now. You mentioned also the April 2023 release. It's the same for the real-time stock tool. So um, we hope to have also a, a functioning uh, a version by that time that we can already uh, use, but there's already been quite a lot of work that's been done um, I don't know if there's uh, already some questions. I actually did not check there, but... Um... Yes, if I can just... Uh, um, one very good question, um, whether there is any limit on the number of Brewmaster temperature sensors that can be connected to the Android device. Uh, I have studied the Brewmaster documentation carefully, uh, also the native app. I'm not aware that there's constraints, but Philip, on the technical side, do you think that there will be limitations? Uh, that's a hard question because um, uh, my application just connects to one. Uh, and I think uh, there's no limitation from the Brewmaster side, but then we're uh, talking performance of the application. If you connect to several uh, Blue Maestro sensors at the time, will it uh, will data collide when you capture, and how slow will the application be? I think that's a um, bigger concern. Did it answer your question? Okay, I think I think we leave it like that. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot for the question, Sean. Did you? I realized that I, we need to consider in our user requirements. Um, if you can, I would be interested what, how many uh, sensors you would think would be a typical use case for you. Do you think two or three would be enough or should we consider five? But uh, uh, yeah, I think. That's a question to the user, uh, Philip, not to you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's, that's a question to Jean de Dieu because we are establishing the user requirements. So I had not thought of it as an excellent question and uh, we need to kind of specify that um, for, for the development, but uh, happy to have input from the field. George, I actually have a question slightly related to Philip that maybe Philip, I wonder if you can just elaborate on the work for you connecting to Bluetooth low energy. So it's something that took you a little bit of time to understand how that worked. Is there anything particular about that and maybe again you may not have the, the the exact answer but is that different with the number of devices that you would eventually connect to if you could say something about this uh yeah so there's different protocols to do this and uh, there's a get protocol and uh, it's very specific and i only managed to uh connect to one but um yeah, but I I haven't looked at it because when I got the one connection, I I was happy with that. So, but uh, when you learn about the Bluetooth low energy um, protocols, uh, I think it's possible. Yeah. To yeah, and it was a, partly a leading question because what I was thinking is what we discussed that there's no connection being established. It's not similar to pairing to a, a, a wireless speaker, for example, like we have at home, but rather you have the sensor broadcasting data and then the app needs to be able to uh, filter or pull for the data that, that they're, they're asking for, that, they're, that that is being requested, also using this uh, hexadecimal. So it was partly a leading question, but <laughs> uh, if you want yeah, to say so anything about that, I, uh... Maybe I didn't explain it uh, in depth, but the idea is the sensor is always advertising data. Uh, 
So the, uh, the job of the application is to go to a sensor and capture the advertised data. So uh, as, if you have five different sensors, as long as you walk past them and they always always advertise, I guess it's uh, possible to capture from each one as you walk by them. Yeah, but then we get into more technical and demanding, uh, I think, yeah, uh, mm. programming uh, uh, requirements there. And I think that's what you mentioned, that you didn't get into that level. You made a connection to one device. And that's the kind of thing that we'll have to explore now when we're developing this uh, further with our development team is how to build in uh, some of these different uh, then technical uh, programming workflows that will facilitate uh, a person in a health facility to be able to capture that data, receive alarms in a way that's also efficient from their functional requirements so that the technical programming and, and equipment requirements uh, facilitate the, the workflow for the person at the facility. Uh, did we have another question here, George? Um, is it a DHS2 now, Android app? Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Is it a DHS2 Android app, or have you developed a separate app to link with DHS2 API? Yeah, so uh, it's it's part DHS2. Uh, the starting point was the Android skeleton app. You can, uh, which is uh, set up with the SDK, and uh, it's linked to the tracker capture app. So uh, that part is uh, simply DJIS2. But the second part is the Bluetooth communication. And that's what I mentioned the uh, GUT service and uh, the BLE uh, packages uh, are separate. So. So now for the further development, it's also another discussion that we're having, and uh, it's probably much more of a technical than, than a functional question. Should this be part of the native uh, DHS2 capture app? So the app that you've all downloaded onto your Android devices, should this be a native function there or should this be a separate app? And there's still some ongoing discussion The likely, and I think what we, at least from the functional perspective, we see it as being more useful being integrated to not have additional apps, but there's still some, some talks about what would be the best solution. Um, so we'll see how, how that actually plays out. But I think the integrated idea is, is much from our perspective, uh, not, not from the, the developer perspective would be to have it integrated. Um, yeah, lots of interest in this from uh, Gerald Thomas. So thanks for that, Gerald. Uh, question from Nora, the expected lifetime of the sensors is two years running 24 seven. Yeah, so battery life and uh, partly related to the uh, to the number of readings that are being made. I don't know if uh, George or Philip, you guys have have an answer to yes, that. Yes, I'm just copy pasting uh, the answer into the window. Yep. Um, so according to the specifications, public documentation, it's a uh, one year continuous data transmission or two years intimated data transmission. So that gives you an idea. But then it's uh, the temperature data log is, is programmable on how often uh, the data is collected. So that will also have an influence. But it's about uh, approximately in that range. And this is why we are also keen on uh, selecting a device which allows you to change the battery. Which is, by the way, the drawback if you have a waterproof sensor, that's great, but I think you will not be able to change the battery, so that's the trade off. And it's a standard battery um, that you can find anywhere in um, one of the CR flat batteries. It is very easy, it doesn't require um, ordering from the manufacturer or something. Yeah, and we have a question about differentiating which sensors are being reported on the app. And I think uh, if I remember the MAC address was visible, but that should be something that could be relatively easily managed with identifying devices. Uh, but Philip, if you want to elaborate. Yeah, so my, my solution was it's a, a minimal viable product. So time was of essence. Uh, so I just used the MAC. MAC address, but you can give it a unique ID and you can change the name of the sensor. So it's fully possible to identify it. Right, that's great. 
We actually had a question in the beginning, and George, I don't know if you'll take this up with the uh, uh, alarms and then an escalation alarm, but Nisreen asks if this connects remotely to responsible people far from the facility, sending alarms for any problems. So the alarms are for the temperature excursion, but there's this issue of alarms and, and uh, escalation. I don't know if you would take that up, George. Specifically. Yeah, reading my mind, it's on, <coughs> it's on my first slide, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so we'll... we'll uh, We'll let you take it during when you present here now. Uh, Abdel asks if it's available for download and you want to buy the hardware and do simulations. Okay, Abdel, so Philip had a link to the GitHub for the code and the sensors are called Blue Maestro sensors. So it's still something that we're working on, uh, but um, in principle, it, it, it is available. And everything that we produce, of course, and once it, there's a final version that we're publishing integrated, it will be freely available. But the sensors are called Blue Maestro sensors. Just a keynote: uh, if you if you download the application from my GitHub repo, you have to change the DJI's two instance. So you have to have your own instance and um, configure a tracker capture program, and uh, then you uh, need to change the credentials for the for the instance. And then the access to each of the sensors is also hard coded with the MAC address. Is that right, Philip? That's correct. Yeah. Don't need to reconnect those to their own sensors. And yeah. You have so the, the MAC address. Go ahead. Yeah. On the back side of the sensor, there's a sticker with the MAC address, and you can just change, uh, just add it in the code. Uh, yeah. All right. I think that's it for the questions now. Again, this is something that we're developing and working on. It's definitely the tool that will require the most future further development, but it's something that, again, we're communicating with partners and donors. We're aligning with uh, uh, standard requirements for remote temperature monitoring. We're connecting with different platforms and different partners offering similar solutions and seeing how is this useful? How is this beneficial? Um, and this is, I think, part of what George then uh, will present now is a bit of the development path and what we're working towards when it comes to, to remote temperature monitoring and this temperature management tool. Do you want to uh, uh, present a bit the... Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Philip. Um, great work. Um, if every master's thesis would be so relevant, um, you know, the world would be a different place. So that's absolutely amazing. And really looking forward to, to taking that uh, that forward. Um, I'm going to share my screen just to mention um, that the the selection of the Blue Maestro temperature sensor temperature data logger was actually a kind of precondition for the project um, because it is open source. And also to mention that there is many. Uh, WHO pre-qualified temperature monitoring devices, but there is actually only two who use Bluetooth, which use Bluetooth. Um, there's one that was pre-qualified um, recently or this year, but according to the catalog, the pre-qualification is lo no longer valid, and that device doesn't provide open source or it doesn't provide access to the source code, so you cannot um, connect to that. Uh, device other than with your with the proprietary application so that's basically the only choice and that's the reason why we made a choice it was not for any other reason that was just Brenner's and my preference um Brenner, you see my screen and i'm going to go into presentation mode yeah that's perfect george okay so okay. thanks for the uh, to nisreen you hit the the nail on the head, it's all about real-time alerts and immediate action. We do see, of course, uh, there's WHO requirements on recording temperatures um, and having a record, uh, twice daily record at least. But of course, um, as a practitioner, your immediate concern is uh, what happens if my refrigerator fails during the night or on the weekend, a day off. And I don't want to come Monday morning and see that all my vaccine is either um, um, spoiled or, or spoiled because the, the power went off and, no, and it took action or because it was frozen. So our 
focus is really on this uh, how to manage alerts, which is a challenge. But of course, in addition, uh, the temperature recording requirements are also um, important. So I have only two slides. So what we are looking for to have prompt immediate alarm on a mobile device in case of temperature excursions. So that's the idea. Somebody leaves a refrigerator open or you have a, a power outage, the temperature rises or the refrigerator is defect and the temperature and the temperature drops and the vaccine is in danger of freezing. That basically as soon as the a temperature excursion is noted, so keep in mind it will take 10 minutes if you're uh, logging every 10 minutes, that immediately with the next measurement you would have an alert on your mobile phone. Um, and we hope to develop that natively in the DHIS2 app. And of course it's critical to take uh, immediate corrective action um, by the storekeeper when she or he is at the store. That's the objective. Uh, the alarms alone are not alone. Uh, are not enough. And then um, if nobody is at the store, then you want somebody uh, who is um, able to take corrective action, so who has the keys and can start the backup generator set or move the vaccine to another refrigerator uh, to immediately go to the facility and take corrective action. Uh, refrigerator should have 24 hours holdover time, but um, so within that time span, uh, take corrective action and um, the holdover time will protect the vaccine against uh, increased temperature. But of course, if your vaccine is in danger of freezing, then uh, vaccines can be damaged by freezing within minutes. And the, um, I'm just mentioning the, the WHO document that we are using also because this is kind of normative uh, reference how to monitor temperatures in the vaccine supply chain. Uh, to my knowledge updated 2015 which gives exact instructions how to measure what to measure. Um, the temperature how to document it but actually to note a uh, fascinating document that at the facility level the possibility of continuous um, temperature monitoring is not even mentioned as best practice. So it is not even a consideration yet, but we hope that will change. Now, if you want to have an alarm on your mobile phone, then basically the application that uh, Philip demonstrated, the assumption is that that mobile phone is uh, connecting, synchronizing data directly with the Blue Maestro um, um, temperature sensor. Um, but that requires then the temperature sensor to be within the range um, of, or rather the mobile device being within the range of the uh, Blue Master temperature data logger. And that is a few meters. So depending on the size of the facility, that could be in the entire clinic or in the vaccination site. But if this is in a hospital in a large pharmacy, that might not be the case. So our thinking is that, of course, the critical point is if, uh, let's say, if you're, in the, if you're in the hospital or in the clinic and the power goes off, obviously you're going to check for your refrigerators. But if you are not in the facility, it's even more critical because you might not notice that uh, the power went off. So our th then, uh, of course, the Blue Master temperature um, data logger is using uh, Bluetooth low energy. So it has only a few meters of uh, <clears throat> range. And um, you will need, so the thinking is to have a second device that is basically kept in the cold store in the range of the uh, temperature data logger of all of them. So usually the refrigerator is kept together. And anyway, we are thinking that uh, hopefully you will be using a mobile device as I showed yesterday for your monthly reporting of your stock on hand and your stock distributed or even for the real-time stock management then anyway it is advised to have a mobile device ideally a backup device at the facility because it's not really good practice for staff to have to use their private mobile devices and if you have a tablet let's say you put it in the in the cold store within range of the sensors and you make sure that it is charged when you leave the, the store um, and it doesn't run out of power on the weekend, 
then we are trying to build an application that will basically take the record alarm on the device in the cold store and then transmit it to any number of mobile devices through an SMS, an email, or a DHIS2 notification. Of course, that does require that the cold store where this dedicated mobile device is left um, is connected to the internet. So uh, briefly, this uh, we have been we have written an extensive document. I think it yeah it has uh, 85 pages currently on the user requirements. So to basically write out in detail what Philip has presented and to add some uh, some final touches. So the idea is the same. You have the Blue Maestro um, uh, temperature data logger that logs the temperature. Um, Starting point is every 10 minutes. It can be less than that if you want, but of course, then you have more data. And uh, as Nora said, you have less uh, battery, uh, short battery lifetime. And you have seen the screenshot uh, uh, for the application in THIS2, but we hope that the application that you have shown will then be innately integrated into THIS2. So it will appear as one of the um, icons uh, that you have already seen in the sandbox. There will just be another icon uh, with the temperature management, and you can access it. Uh, everything else will be running in the in the background. Uh, so the the Android app you use it for configuring sen sensors, synchronizing the data. Um, we are thinking of maybe storing the twenty thousand data points. That is something to confirm. And again, the important point is the alerts. And the mobile device then will synchronize with the web portal, as I mentioned, in order to manage the notifications, but also in order to um, provide the analytics, the dashboards that you can see some examples of. Uh, you can have a pivot table with the, with the recording, but also can have a chart with a minimum, maximum. And we're also uh, thinking we also will count the number of alerts, so the number of excursions and ideally the dura duration um, and uh, calculate the minimum, the average, maybe the mean kin kinetic temperature. Okay, and oops, wrong screen. Yeah, so this is kind of a very crude mock-up uh, just done in Excel, the way we think we could maybe have um, a visualization on the mobile device because what is important for me as a storekeeper is I want to see the excursion. So you could have basically in green, you have the average, you can see that it was in range the first few days and it went out of range. Then you can see the when it froze and how long it froze. Hopefully this will not happen because you will have the real time alerts, but still it will give you a complete record. And on the bottom, if you can, if it's not too small, you can see the number of upper and lower limit um, excursions. Um, that were recorded. So that's kind of the first uh, mock-up, but the analytics is still to be seen on the mobile device, on the web portal, exactly what data do we want to present in, on what way. I don't know, uh, Brent, do you want to take some questions before I move on? I don't think there's any immediately. Uh, Nisreen just comments okay. that it's better to react in one hour. And yeah, but I think you can continue, George. OK. So um, exciting new development that I at least only learned recently is that um, WHO has issued in January, uh, sorry, it should be PQS, of course, not uh, P PWS. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, that's too embarrassing. Sorry for that. Um, okay, back to the slideshow. Uh, on it's called the equipment monitoring system, and it's an M to M, so it's a machine to machine uh, interface. And uh, the idea of the PQS standard is that uh, it will eliminate the need for a separate uh, temperature data logger. Like Breno said, we are not, uh, we don't, we want to basically be able to connect to any um, Bluetooth sensor that is on the market. Of course, it is WHO pre qualified and uh, the Brewmaster is kind of the pilot, but eventually we would like to expand that. 
But the dream is, of course, that you don't need a temperature data logger, but rather that temperature data logger is integrated into the device already. And that, uh, I mean, some devices do have uh, th uh, thermometers, like small LEDs on the screen, but this would be like a full-fledged temperature data logger that is not only showing the current temperature, but actually logging the temperature. So the manufacturer integrates a sensor uh, in the equipment and, um, and locks, I mean. Um, so you have an equipment identification that's quite amazing. So if you were to connect in future um, your refrigerator freezer to a DH2, DHS2 uh, mobile application, then automatically every uh, piece of cold chain equipment would automatically identify itself like an aircraft does, does with a transponder. So there's no need anymore to attach, uh, create unique identifiers, attach them to the, to the device that would also already be built in. And you might notice that these four pieces of information is exactly the WHO, um, PQS standard and global asset management, which I will briefly mention tomorrow. So all those uh, information that in future will be required to be included in the barcode or GS1 data matrix code on the equipment will also be available um, through um, digital authentication. Compressor information, total runtime, this can be probably really useful for the cold chain technician. You have the minimum maximum average temperature. It's calculating the alarm limits, the time of the excursions. Um, you also can record the voltage availability. Um, even a door lid opening sensor is mandatory. So the number of times that the refrigerator is open, the cumulative time that the refrigerator was open, humidity, condenser and fan data. So um, a requirement is to log that every 15 minutes minimum and to have at least one year of data stored on the device. So quite amazing almost um, reminds me of rockets with telemetric uh, functionality, where you basically um, have all this information um, available digitally. Now, one caveat is that the data transmission, there is clear standards, is that the um, PQS requirement is only to have a USB interface. So you have to be, the storekeeper has to be able to connect uh, a laptop computer or a mobile device with a USB cable and basically read out the data. But obviously, if you're reading out the data on Monday morning and you saw, you see that all your vaccine froze on Friday in the night, it's good to know, like Philippe say, you will pre prevent vaccinating a child with um, a vaccine that is not um, effective, but you still lose uh, your vaccine and uh, might not be able to, to vaccinate other uh, children. But there's an optional feature um, which um, allows sharing the data through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And this is basically uh, what we're going on. We hope that today's is optional. Um, we hope that many manufacturers will voluntarily include this option. I'm sure it will only cost them um, a dollar or maybe less to do that. And we want to be prepared. Um, so the requirement is that um, for all the new PQS uh, pre-qualifications from I think 2024, this is, will be mandatory. Of course, it's going to take many years until all the equipment in the field is exchanged. Um, but uh, we think this is a really exciting um, uh, development and will greatly uh, facilitate the temperature monitoring. So no, no need for paper and no need to manage uh, external devices. And uh, the hope is that in future, you can basically walk into any cold store that uh, has this system installed, switch on your DHIS2 mobile app and just um, connect to the refrigerators and read out and store the data in the DHIS2 database without having any uh, configuration. And a dream coming true. This is actually a screenshot from the WHO PQS uh, requirement. It's my last uh, screenshot. So you can see you have the appliance identified. Uh, you have the, you can see upper alarm limit. Um, 
So the temperature was above eight degrees for 10 hours, below 0 0.5 for one hour. You have a complete readout of the temperature, <clears throat> uh, the total alarm time, the power, uh, how long the refrigerator had had a power, the compressor running time, and also apparently automatically locked uh, faults. So that's really an amazing development. Uh, it's not coming tomorrow, but um, hopefully in a few years, this will be the standard. And uh, we definitely want to be prepared for that. SM, <clears throat> so yeah, should we take questions or any comments from anybody? Uh, just a, let's see, Robert has a comment. I think it would be great to configure automated real-time email or SMS alerts in the LMIS for the temperature alarms to facilitate quick response. Yeah, so this is definitely what we exactly what we are planning. So you can see here um, the alerts that uh, we envisage. So as I mentioned, you would have the alerts coming directly from the mobile device, directly on the mobile device but um, DHS2 natively has functionality that if you synchronize your mobile device with the, with the database, then the, um, then the database, the DHS2 database can prompt alerts to the, sorry, to the mobile device um, through the notifications. But of course, we're also thinking of SMS alerts or email alerts, definitely. And then maybe just a quick comment from uh, Kosi or a quick question about uh, not using Wi-Fi. So these sensors, they only support Bluetooth. And uh, so then there's no Wi-Fi option to connect in that way. However, there are definitely other sensors. However, the long-term development path is through this EMS uh, uh, requirement and that we go that route rather than developing individual connections to each sensor based on what their current capacity is. But back over to you, George. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, as I mentioned, we have carefully studied the PQS uh, pre-qualifications. And it's my understanding that currently this is uh, Brewmaster is a, the, the single device that currently still holds uh, WH, uh, PQS, WHO PQS pre-qualification. So it doesn't look like many uh, manufacturers are going down that path. Of course, maybe others might be developing. I'm not sure I understand the question on the Wi-Fi, uh, but it's my understanding that if you want to use a, a Wi-Fi connection, then that would require using a gateway. Um, I don't know. I have not uh, seen any PQS pre-qualified sensor, uh, temperature data logger that can connect directly to a wireless network. Yeah, that was the connection. That was the question if a connection could be made from the sensor to a Wi Fi network and then connecting to the device. Uh, actually, I saw Alex has his hand up here. So, Alex, if you want to ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I was trying to figure out how do you match the vaccine batch with the, the refrigerator? Because now you would want to know if the vaccine batch uh, got spoiled or not. I was trying to figure out how do you now match the two. Now, basically the supply chain side and then now the temperature monitoring. Okay, excellent question. You are a step ahead. We are dreaming of this. It is on our roadmap. Um, so we do envisage, um, but again, this is like um, iteration three or four. We do envisage that um, if you were to use a real-time uh, system, stock management uh, system, that when you um, put away your vaccine and when you pick it from the refrigerator, fee ref refrigerator freezer, that you will every time identify the uh, refrigerator freezer um, through a GS1 data management code or maybe automatically so that you can link the batch with the refrigerator. So we're definitely looking into the possibility of doing that. The problem will be that in order to clearly identify the batch, um, that will only work with a GS1 data matrix code because otherwise, if you just receive um, measles vaccine and you would have to like uh, type in the batch number, um, expiry date that you're entering your refrigerator, that would probably be too cumbersome. 
but indeed the GS1 data matrix code at the secondary packaging level is already um, a requirement by UNICEF and Gavi officially since I think uh, January last year. And that is possible and we are looking into that. I don't know if it mentioned basically, uh, I have demonstrated the real-time stock management mode that you have seen uh, yesterday. The next step will be to include batch numbers and expiry dates if you're integrated with an upstream system. And then the next version, next iteration that we are th thinking of looking into is uh, to use GS1 data matrix codes for the stock management. And once that, if that were to be available, then you could link it with a refrigerator. And uh, definitely we're thinking of that um, even going a bit further that if you were to integrate DHIS2 with an upstream national ELMIS, like you have seen with Exis M Supply or this afternoon Bileta, then you could even envisage that if upstream the same recording is done, that at any time you could have a complete temperature record of the vaccine as it travels from store to, to store uh, across its entire lifetime, ideally also on the truck or in the cold box doing transportation. So thanks for that. George, we questions? Have two, yeah, two, a comment and a question, and I can give a quick uh, reaction and also if you want to fill in. So first from Nora, uh, she writes, we're seeing some very good examples of how digital technology can help and support healthcare services. We also need to help ensure low resource settings also get enough support to also be part of these developments. And I think this is entirely in line uh, Nora, with what we've proposed here, uh, last mile solutions that can be implemented in low resource sites and also at scale, considering all of the aspects, both the technical, the human aspect, who, the workflow and how that matches uh, their requirements, also uh, the, the sustainability, both from a technical, but also from a financial perspective. So very much in line with what we're looking at here. And then secondly, from Kosi about the connection between the sensor and the app. How do you handle the sensor broadcast to ensure you're getting a transmission from the expected sensor? For instance, if there are other sensors nearby. So Kosi, this is a uh, similar to, to how if you have multiple you know, speakers or wireless speakers you're connecting to. So the app will be able to identify by the MAC address. So the MAC address is a specific uh, uh, address uh, uh, identifying the network uh, or, or the transmitter through a network. So it's sort of like a serial number for the internet connection or for the, the, the wireless connection that identifies that specific sensor. And it's partly what Philip also said that we could provide a name and connect that MAC address to a name. So we identify which sensor is which uh, for which device. I don't know if you have comments to those two points, George, if not, we can continue. We have eight minutes left in the session. Yeah, just a brief comment on what Noah said, definitely. Uh, I mean, I suppose, uh, you're all aware, but just to be uh, safe, um, I mean, the, I the details are given the PQS catalog, so I will not give numbers, but um, the great majority of the available uh, temperature monitoring devices um, that are specified in the PQS catalog, um, they require annual fees. Uh, myself, I have worked in a, on a project in one of the leading uh, suppliers basically you buy a device you have a one-off cost that can range anything between 50 and three thousand dollars for a cold room that can be depending on the sophistication but in addition most of those um, business models foresee that for each and every sensor that you install in a clinic you pay an annual fee um, and you can imagine that even if that fee is only a few uh, dollars per year per device. If you add it up to hundreds of thousands of clinics, that's a huge cost. So that's uh, why we think that using DHIS2 is free and open source uh, application would be a big contribution because basically you don't need to eliminate this uh, recurring cost. And uh, one of the features apart from the transmission is that these business models provide you then also access to a web portal, uh, where you can study the analytics, but this is basically baked into DHIS2. So no need to pay um, to have your data hosted on a database and shown on the dashboard, provided that you're already hosting a DHIS2 server. Great, I'm just trying to capture some of this in writing as well, George, so we can, uh, I hope to be able to make a 
Q&A or an FAQ actually from this uh, questions channel so that we have this published also on our website. There's been a lot of great feedback and comments, but I think that's it for now. George, if you want to continue. Yeah, that was uh, all I had. Just a comment what I'm reading on the uh, on the question and answer. So indeed, we are thinking, uh, coming back to this question of like recording the refrigerator freezer where goods are stored. Um, unfortunately, it's, I think it's quite tricky because you have to identify the, the products. And uh, uh, commonly, um, drug products only have a barcode with a product number which is just a, a seven or eight digit number, but it doesn't identify the batch. So if you want to um, record exactly which batch was stored in which refrigerator freezer, you will have to have um, a GS1 data matrix code on every secondary packaging, um, which is a given for vaccines, but also keep in mind, uh, something we will need to study carefully is that uh, it sounds very um, you know, enticing, uh, exciting, but it will also require that if you receive a cold box or even a small refrigerated truck and you have hundreds of uh, packages of uh, vaccine, then you will have to scan each and every GS1 data matrix code because every secondary package has its own serialized number. Or the alternative to avoid that is that you're integrated with an upstream system. And um, as I mentioned, uh, if the upstream system is able to load all your serialized number into a future DHIS2 version, then that would also take care of the stock receipt. But it is quite intricate. And then we'll have to see the practicality in the field uh, because you will have to then really thoughtlessly record every secondary packaging uh, one by one. If you miss it, then uh, you will not have a record. All right, George, I think we, uh, if we've wrapped up, I don't see any more. Do we have any new questions? We have a comment from Robert. Um, yeah, so linking vaccine to refrigerator, but that's a comment to, he made to Alex, actually. I'll let you all read that. I think we're okay. Um, again, this is something that we're developing, trying to, fill a need, fill a gap, very much in line with what uh, uh, you commented, Nora, about making it available to uh, low resource settings and making sure that it's sustainable in, in multiple ways, both from a technology, financial, and, and, and different ways that it, it suits uh, the, the, uh, the, the sites and the locations which, where it will be implemented. Um, I think this is all great. Any more feedback, any more requirements, both for the biomedical equipment management, cold chain equipment inventory management, the previous session, and this one on temperature, any feedback, any questions, any uh, inputs, we're very welcome to receive that. So feel free to share either through Slack, through email, or any other uh, channel to understand the requirements and understand what kind of uh, uh, use cases you have and how we can, we can help uh, uh, meet those. A lot of what we show is still, you know, configurable, adaptable. It doesn't have to be implemented out of the box as we show, but it can be uh, customized for, for the different contexts in, in more of a general sense. So uh, if you have very specific needs, also uh, reach out to us and we, we'd be happy to hear. It. And if it's something that's useful, we can also include it as, as part of the regular guidance for, for the configuration. So we have Two minutes, but again, no need to uh, uh, to go on if we have all of the um, questions answered. All of this content is there. I'll share again the links to the presentations, but uh, you have uh, quite a few documents and resources already that uh, you can access for this. So let me know um, if there's any other points, but if not, we can stop here. We'll take a 15 minute break, actually 16 minute break, and we'll be back at 1 p.m. Oslo time, so in six. And we want we want to welcome uh, Suganya from the uh, Belida team, who will present uh, their ELMIS solution. I think uh, Suganya, correct me if I'm wrong. You'll also be joined by Danushka, but uh, you can confirm that. So we've had some talks with them, and we will then yeah hand over to you.
you can uh, uh, take the time that you need. We have 45 minutes, but if you go a bit longer, a bit shorter, that's fine because we'll be following up by question and answer. Uh, you can also check the Slack channel throughout because there may come some questions uh, in the questions channel there. Um, and um, if there's anything, just to speak up when we can we can support. But we're, we've had a very active uh, uh, three days already. Lots of questions, lots of engagement. So we're looking forward to hear what you have to present. And the floor is yours. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Breno. We have uh, Adanushka. Hi, Soganya, and hi, Breno. Uh, great. So let me start by sharing my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, and am I audible? Yeah, that's okay. Perfect. Great. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, hi everyone. Um, so, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, based on wherever you are located around the world. Um, and thank you very much for the interest and connecting to our presentation today. Um, so we are really excited and we really, really appreciate your participation. Um, about myself, um, Danushka Kavindu, uh, Product Manager for Intuition Vesta Product Vertical in uh, Billeta Private Limited. I've been with the company for the past six years and have worked with um, LMIS product from the scratch and I have been on the ground for all of our implementation in Asia and Africa. Uh, I think most of you would have joined uh, previous two LMI's presentations as well. And I believe most of you are having a good understanding of the capabilities of LMI solutions. So uh, during my presentation, I will give you um, an introduction to Belita uh, and will explain about uh, the problems and challenges we saw when we were developing the system. And I will explain a little bit about, about the functionalities of the system and highlight some key features uh, and implementation approaches and uh, the support mechanism. Uh, also at the end of the presentation, I'm really happy to answer any questions that you all have. Um, yeah, I hope we are good to start. Uh, great, so about Belita uh, Private Limited, uh, we started back in 2020, 2010. Um, so as a uh, enterprise scale solutions providing company, uh, and we are hundred plus at the moment, uh, our specializations are with uh, web mobile uh, technologies, and uh, we have a, a software solutions for supply chain management uh, um, and uh, other healthcare uh, applications. So we are focusing on digital finance, procurement, smart manufacturing, and also we have decision support systems with uh, AI capabilities. Um, so all of these solutions are built uh, on a single platform called Intuition. Um, so it allows to be integrate with all our solutions and, and uh, with that we have been able to build a good interoperable layer where we can integrate with other solutions. Uh, so this is our Intuition platform. Uh, with four main products. Uh, we have a fully fledged ERP, mainly implemented in um, South Asia, covering industries such as manufacturing, retail, health, hospitality, and um, services. And then we have our Intuition Vesta ELMI solution, uh, which is the focus uh, product for today's presentation. Uh, and also we have a standard treatment guideline application for health workers uh, implemented in Eswatini. Uh, then a COVID-19 surveillance platform uh, implemented in Sri Lanka. Uh, throughout the years, several technologies have won many awards um, and, uh, uh, and I thought it would be worth highlighting the Commonwealth Digital Conference Award back in 2017. Uh, and also, we were recently uh, runners up uh, in Asia Pacific IT awards uh, last year. 
so this is just um, a quick snapshot of the solutions we have around the, the world for ELMIS. Um, and this is kind of a research conducted by uh, Global Fund and Gavi back in 2019. So these are the vendors and, and um, these are the functionalities they provide. Um, uh, so uh, the thing is, um, so we are also a solution which has all the, the, the compliancy and a very fully compliant ELMI solution, uh, which are taking all the boxes um, and, and all the requirements which are highlighted by uh, the donors. Uh, not only that, uh, there were many recognitions. Um, this is just extract from Accenture report back in 2019, highlighting the importance of our decision support system in uh, health management uh, logistics space. Yeah, so that was about Belita and where we co uh, come from. And now let's focus on um, the ELMI solutions. Uh, so this is what uh, we think when we talk about um, uh, health supply chain, when we talk about uh, the warehouse management, but is this the reality um, in when middle income countries? So I'm coming from a, a place where we have different conditions. We've seen uh, very tough conditions uh, and, and we wanted to build a solution to uh, match this reality and to deal with different uh, conditions. So that's why uh, we built uh, Intuition Vesta uh, uh, electronic logistic management solution. So these were the, the main things um, you need to make sure uh, uh, the six logistic rights. So you have to make sure you have right products, the right in right quantity, in right condition, at right places, at the right time, at the right cost. So we were focusing on this, and then we were uh, checking what are the challenges. We were researching, and we were uh, going to different locations uh, around the world to see what are the challenges. Uh, the health ministries and um, service delivery points are facing when it comes to uh, logistic management. Uh, so these were the key things that we saw when we were developing the solution and, and um, there are new things getting added up and we're building solution to uh, cater those needs. Um, so we were checking whether we have, whether those uh, locations are having uh, proper forecasting mechanism. Can they uh, project their pipeline um, do they know uh, what are the, the requirements for next three months, six months, or for a given time period? And uh, do you have a proper distribution mechanism? So when you receive commodities, do you know uh, where you should uh, push these commodities? Uh, do you know the demand uh, in, in different locations? And uh, can you cater for uh, different programs such as uh, maybe family planning, maybe maternal child health, maybe um, TB, HIV, likewise. So can you have a solution which can cater for all the programs in the country? But then uh, we were looking at um, uh, the data. So uh, can um, health facilities have a real-time visibility um, to their stocks? Can higher levels get a quick snapshot about uh, the locations in real time. And uh, uh, can you track and trace uh, batch numbers, lot numbers, VVM stages, expiries? And are you getting advanced notifications to take better decisions? Um, so if, if products are getting expired today, you need to get those communicated in advance. Are you getting those communications? So we were, um, thinking through these uh, things. Then uh, the stock management, can you manage stocks uh, in your warehouse? Uh, do you know your receipts versus the consumption in your um, service delivery point? And do you have a proper mechanism for uh, cold chain management, expert okay. management? Um, and also uh, there were other interesting things like uh, when we go to countries, there are a lot of systems implemented and um, uh, how can you fit in your solution uh, within uh, the existing um, uh, 
systems which are already in place for example um, if you go to a country you may have um, dhis2 implemented you may have other erp systems implemented um, so how are you going to integrate with those solutions and um, provide the solutions the software solutions only for the requirements uh, the countries are having so we were thinking about those and also we saw a lot of infrastructure constraints um, so uh, there were not uh, there were locations which are not having good internet um, in some locations they are not, uh, having uh, interrupted electricity so how we can provide a solution to counter all of these um, challenges so that was our uh, uh, main um, objective when when developing the solution so uh, that's why we came with came up with uh, intuition vesta uh, elmi solution um, so counter all of those um, challenges we saw uh, we developed uh, online web based uh, elmi solution and um, also we developed uh, offline desktop uh, application um, so which can work online and offline um, it can work without internet as well and whenever you have internet it will start synchronizing data and then we created uh, uh, two mobile apps one is a transaction based mobile application you can do transactions um, in service delivery points um, or else we have another mobile application um, which is um, having data entry module um, if you are not ready with the warehouse to go um, and implement uh, uh, a fully fledged uh, elmi solution you can start with uh, a data entry uh, application and all of these uh, data we capture are connected with our decision support system which we have built uh, around power bi and uh, with our reports and with our no notification mechanism so this gives kind of a, a 360 view uh, of um, your uh, uh, logistic management um, in your organization and it can cater for all the levels uh, across the supply chain so these are the uh, main features we have um, in the solution uh, so we have pipeline forecasting procurement management uh, distribution and transportation management uh, inventory management warehouse management dispensing systems where we where you dispense commodities to um, the patients then we have an asset management module uh, and also we have a good interoperable layer to connect with other health systems and like i explained earlier all of this information can be visualized using dashboards and reports which i will explain later so this is a basic uh, use case uh, when it comes to um, logistic management um, which uh, I will explain the functionalities uh, through this and how beneficial uh, ELMI system could be in this scenario for an example so before you uh, procure anything uh, from the suppliers you need to know the the forecast uh, for the next six months three months or for a given time period so you can use the the forecasting tool built in the system and uh, identify the uh, the future demand uh, then based on that you can go and procure commodities uh, using the system so once uh, you uh, create the purchase orders and uh, conduct the procurement then you can inbound your commodities to your national store uh, even this can happen at uh, regional levels, provincial levels as well. Uh, the system can be configurable uh, based on your requirements. Uh, so when you procure from the national store, uh, basically you need to deliver those commodities uh, to different levels like regional, provincial, uh, if you have local government levels, those levels and uh, to the service delivery points so if you have a elmi system um, 
you can conduct all of those activities in a single system and um, then the, the, the full information will be available in a single system, which will allow you to uh, understand uh, real time, uh, which, which will allow you to uh, see uh, real time snapshot of uh, all the activities happening um, across the supply chain. Uh, not only that, um, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have expanded uh, our solution uh, to vaccine management. Um, so one thing uh, we saw was there were lack of systems to uh, conduct uh, vaccination sessions. So we built a different solution around uh, our platform to cater these needs. So we created a multi-channel citizen registration system. Um, and um, so using that citizens can get registered for vaccination sessions. Then um, from the admin panel, uh, administrators, they can set up different eligibility verification criteria and prioritization criteria. Based on that um, appointments uh, will get scheduled and those will get communicated to the citizens. So with these appointment scheduling, um, using those data, uh, a pipeline can be uh, done. And based on that, uh, the procurement um, can be, uh, you can conduct your procurement. Uh, then uh, once you procure commodities, those can be distributed uh, uh, to your central levels and then um, to uh, uh, different other levels uh, after service delivery points. Then um, we created a mechanism to manage the dosages of the vaccines. And also we created um, a, a, a mobile application to administer the vaccines. And also uh, we created a mechanism um, uh, to report the adverse events which are occurring due to the vaccines and uh, also uh, vaccine certificates can be generated uh, uh, using the system. So these are a few additions uh, which we did uh, uh, like add-ons uh, to uh, existing ELMI solution. Um, also, I thought it uh, would be worth highlighting um, asset management capability of the solution. So if you, uh, have, uh, let's say, uh, assets like uh, different machineries, uh, different devices, um, and if you want to maintain assets um, of the warehouses in the system. So we have asset management module built into the system. So using that, uh, you can record the breakdowns, uh, you can create uh, preventive maintenance schedules, um, even you can uh, transfer the assets from uh, one location to another, then you can generate um, reports on assets. Um, and also uh, we have enabled the capabilities to integrate with uh, RTM devices where we capture um, uh, temperature readings. Uh, and also, if you don't have the capabilities to integrate with uh, RTM devices, we have given uh, like uh, manual forms where uh, health workers can enter temperature recordings into the system. Uh, also, we support uh, GS1 barcoding. Uh, so we have a three layer barcode generation and label printing mechanism built into the system. Um, and uh, we're compliant with GS1, we are connecting with uh, GLN and JTN platforms with GS1 India. Um, and we have a, a barcode application uh, built by our company, um, uh, which I will show you a quick demo. So this is the barcode uh, application we have built. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, if you have the purchase order, you can um, uh, scan the barcodes for the uh, incoming commodities. Uh, you can scan them. 
when you are receiving the commodities, uh, then you can, uh, so system will automatically capture the, the batch numbers, expiries. Uh, so you just have to verify uh, the quantity. Same applies to the uh, outbound shipment as well. So you will have the sales order, then you will have the invoice. Um, since when we are doing the outbound shipment uh, from the system, uh, by using the, the barcode scanner, uh, you can uh, scan the batch numbers, then uh, verify the, the quantities and uh, you can uh, dispatch the commodity. So, so this will allow you to accurately capture the uh, batches uh, using the system. Um, uh, then uh, if you move on to the, uh, the AI capabilities of the solution uh, and the forecasting that we provide uh, with AI capabilities. Um, so this is the uh, machine learning model that we are using uh, in the system. Uh, so basically we gather raw data um, from uh, ELMI systems and also uh, we are connecting um, other data sources such as supply data sources, such as uh, da uh, data sources from to capture different other factors. So then we conduct uh, uh, data analysis and the data currency. And uh, then uh, we are doing the feature engineering to highlight specific features um, to identify these features. Then we do feature scaling and data preparation, and then we train the models, and then we identify the most accurate models. So uh, once we identify the best uh, model, then we uh, take all the, the factors, and we put those factors into the model, and then we create uh, predictions. So right now, uh, in our uh, forecasting tool, we are using a light GBM model. Um, and these are the factors that we are using um, to generate the, the forecast. So basically, uh, we are using factors relating to country, province, district, and we take the growth rates uh, in the regions. Uh, then we count for campaigns and other programs. Um, then uh, we count for lags in consumption. Um, then we rank location product categories. Um, then we are uh, taking the impact like COVID impact or, or, or else you are actually having different pandemics, those impacts um, into the model. Um, then we're taking um, uh, information from LMIs where we uh, capture order field rates, monthly stockouts likewise, and then lead time uh, for distribution. So by using that, uh, we have seen accuracy levels around 80% um, uh, with this model, but we are trying to uh, take it to the 90% to mark. And um, that's the research our team is doing right now to uh, make it more accurate uh, and try to be, bring it uh, to a level where we can have 90, 95% of uh, accuracy. Um, also, using the system, uh, you can generate uh, different reports like transaction reports, analytic reports. Um, transaction reports are like uh, the direct uh, reports that you can generate from the system, like purchase order reports, commodity receive issue reports, um, um, the reports about your stock adjustments. Uh, physical uh, inventory counts, uh, likewise. But if you take um, analytical reports, uh, that could be relating to pipeline forecasting, uh, your stockouts, uh, your uh, stockout trends, uh, then uh, reporting trends, uh, then summarized data, likewise. So all of these information, uh, you can visualize as PDFs, or else you can download those as uh, Excel, uh, Excel tables or as raw data Excel. 
so this is a small demonstration about the, the reporting tool. Um, so basically we have a report pool with a lot of reports which can be configured based on your requirement. Um, then once you provide the permission for the reports, uh, users will have this dashboard in front of them. They can select the report which uh, they want to uh, visualize. Um, if you hover over, you can see the description about the report. Uh, then you can apply the filters. The filters can be uh, customized based on your requirements. In this one, you have like uh, product uh, filters. You can run it for single product or multiple products. And you can run the report by product group, uh, then by warehouse, then by uh, organization level, whether you are running it to the province, entire country, or a specific district. Likewise, then you can run it for uh, the financial period you require. Um, after that, you can preview the report as a PDF or else, like I mentioned you earlier, you can download it for Excel, uh, Excel row data, Excel tables. Uh, so if you preview the report, uh, it, it, will, it will show you a report like this in PDF uh, format. So we have made it uh, very simple for the users. Uh, they can quickly uh, read the description about the report. Uh, then uh, they can apply the required filters and they can uh, download the report in PDF or in Excel formats. And if you if they want to further analyze the report, they can um, download uh, that report in uh, uh, Excel raw data format, and then they can um, uh, do their further analysis. Uh, so these are the dashboard and KPI um, as we have uh, in the system. Um, so we have uh, shown the information in uh, different types of uh, visualizations. Uh, it could be pie charts, uh, GIS maps, tables, graphs, bar charts. Um, uh, so basically these uh, reports, uh, these dashboards and KPIs are country specific. Uh, based on countries needs, we can uh, customize uh, these uh, dashboards uh, and provide the, the information based on countries uh, requirement. Um, so let me uh, share my screen and try to show you uh, yeah, so this is uh, basically a, a Power BI dashboard which we have done uh, by connecting the data sources from um, the ELMIS. Uh, in the, uh, so we have basically categorized those based on the health programs of the country. So for in first uh, tab, you have uh, data uh, relating to the performance of the system itself. Then you have different dashboards for different programs and the KPIs. So if you um, check the performance of the uh, system, you can see uh, the stock out by the, the periods and uh, what are the stock out commodities you have. Uh, then the system shows the reporting status uh, of the, uh, the country. Uh, so this will give you a better indication whether you are seeing 100% uh, data of the country or whether you're seeing just 50, 60% of the data in the country. Because like I explained earlier, we have different systems in place. So if you have all the uh, facilities using the web-based solution, you will have 100% reporting. But if you're using offline solutions, sometimes it may take time to synchronize based on the internet availability. So the system shows uh, the reporting levels uh, based on that. Uh, so these uh, dashboards are very interactive. You can drill down uh, those two uh, different levels. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, the dashboards uh, getting filtered for those different levels and you can 
uh, analyze information like that. Um, so likewise, we uh, show uh, different uh, visualizations for commodity receive issues generated. Um, and um, these are very specific uh, for uh, countries' needs. So we can um, get sp those specific needs by customizing these uh, dashboards. So if you go to a program, uh, so you have their consumption uh, for that program, and then on top stock on hand, and the expiries and the loss rates. If you select uh, consumption, you can select a specific product and you can see uh, uh, how's the consumption uh, around province, then you can drill down to different levels uh, to see uh, what are the uh, consumptions in district levels, uh, local level, government levels, then uh, at the SDPs. Then uh, we have month of uh, stock on hand, that's kind of a very good indication to show uh, for how many months you have stocks um, in uh, your country. So you can uh, again select the product and then you can see where you have uh, stock outs for the specific product and where you have satisfactory stocks, uh, where you have overstocks, understocks and dead stocks uh, in the country. And if you go to expiries, um, similarly, we um, show the ex uh, expiries um, by percentage. Uh, so you can uh, see the products which are getting expired. So we show the expiries in one month, three months, and six months intervals. And the best thing is also the system, we have a notification uh, mechanism. Uh, where you will get notified uh, about the, the expiries. Uh, the loss rate, uh, the similar concept applies. Um, and if I go to KPIs, uh, so we show KPIs like order field rate, uh, expiry, um, and with expiry and uh, loss rate. Uh, then we show the lead times, uh, where you have lead times, uh, then local versus foreign procurements and uh, procurement by funding source. Um, so this uh, list of KPIs can uh, be different uh, based on the country's requirements. So that's why I said uh, we're creating very custom dashboards uh, based on country specific needs. Um, yeah, so let me uh, move into the presentation again. So um, then I think uh, it's worth highlighting the interoperable capability of the solution. Uh, system can be integrated with um, the solutions which are already in place or else the solutions that you are planning to uh, implement. So that's why we have created a, a very good interoperable layer with uh, the best REST APIs. Um, and uh, we have done uh, these sort of integrations with uh, like RTM devices, we have done with ERP systems, we have done integrations with uh, EMR systems, um, and also you can integrate with DHIS2, uh, which uh, I will highlight in the next slide. Um, and um, then you, you don't have to implement the, the full solution, uh, full uh, ELMI solution, but what you can do is you can implement the missing components. Uh, let's say if you need the, the procurement module to be implemented. So you can implement the procurement module uh, from uh, Vesta ELMI system. And um, if you're ha already having, uh, let's say a ERP system, which handling uh, inventory and all of those activities, you can use your um, system by integrating with uh, Intuition Vesta. Or else, let's say if you need uh, inventory and warehouse capabilities, but already you are having um, 
the procurement systems in place. Uh, again, you can, um, uh, there's no need to switch for our full system. You can uh, use your existing system, but you can integrate with our system to get uh, inventory and warehousing capabilities. So likewise, um, with our interoperable layer, that's what we are enabling. Uh, for an example, if you, if you take our implementation in Zimbabwe, um, so they are already having uh, Microsoft Dynamics ERP system in their uh, central warehouses. So, uh, so what we did was we are we implemented the solution uh, for the other levels, uh, uh, which are having which they have um, after their central warehouses. Um, so all the 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 procurement um, and central warehouse related activities are happening in Microsoft Dynamics, but from then onwards, uh, up to service delivery points, we are managing the commodities using uh, our ELMI system. So likewise, uh, we can create integrations uh, based on uh, your requirements. Uh, so these are the, the solutions and this is how you can implement the solution um, so you basically have your central level provincial district levels uh, local level government levels and service delivery points and these are the solutions at each level you can implement so if you take the lowest level the service delivery point um, if you have proper internet if you are um, fine with your internet connectivity then you can go and implement our online application but let's say you are having uh, on and off internet connectivity and, uh, um, the connection is interrupted uh, you can uh, go ahead and implement our offline application which is a windows based desktop application it has the the same capabilities to perform all the activities uh, to invent, uh, for inventory for warehousing for procurement um, likewise, um, then if you are um, again having intra internet, but if you would have uh, proper infrastructure place like laptops, printers, then you can go ahead with the mobile application, uh, which is again a transaction based mobile application. Uh, and also, if you have specific uh, vaccination needs at service delivery points, you can use our uh, vaccine information management system. So you can use our vaccine information management uh, system um, to provide vaccines for uh, the patients. Um, however, if you don't have a capability to implement a transaction-based system, then uh, you can implement uh, our data entry uh, application or else you can implement DHIS2 data entry application. For an example, if you're already with DHIS2 and uh, already if you have placed systems with DHIS2, there's no need uh, you go with our uh, data entry application um, or else um, any of the applications uh, which are capturing data. So you can uh, directly go with DHIS2 and then from there onwards, we can uh, take data to uh, other levels and you can implement uh, full-scale ELMIS in other levels. And whatever the information you are recording from service delivery points uh, will get integrated to the uh, the fully fledged uh, ELMI system. And those information can be used to generate your uh, forecast and uh, those information can be in your uh, reports, dashboards, likewise. Um, so, and also with, um, at each level, we are providing our decision support system, which is coming with uh, uh, notifications, uh, then uh, which is throwing emails, uh, which is throwing, um, uh, which is having dashboards, reports uh, for you to get alerted. And um, uh, then 
for your local level government um, so you can implement online offline mobile and uh, vaccine management information system but we don't recommend uh, having uh, a data entry system in those locations because we expect the transaction volumes are really high and um, if you do uh, have a transaction based system that's where you can get uh, a lot of uh, accurate data and, and real time data and and at the district level, um, uh, you can implement uh, our online, offline applications. But at that level, we don't recommend having mobile-based transaction system because uh, the levels could, uh, the transaction volume would be very high. And if you go uh, up in the order for provincial and central levels, uh, we're mainly recommending. Um, online application, uh, which is a web-based application where you need to have uh, proper internet to uh, have an up and running system. Um, so we uh, always propose online application because we uh, uh, always expect the transaction volumes to be really high. Uh, and uh, at these levels, uh, stock levels and the uh, uh, stock levels and, and the transactions uh, they perform need to be monitored in real time. Um, so this is our uh, project uh, deployment approach. Uh, so you can go to a country, uh, when we gather requirements based on our RFP or else we conduct uh, requirement gathering sessions, uh, then we visit sites and we see how's the readiness of the sites because then based on that we need to decide uh, whether we are going with offline mobile uh, data entry or else with the, the web-based application so those decisions will happen uh, based on site readiness uh, and then what we do is we conduct uh, software customizations configurations uh, and once uh, the system is customized uh, based on the, the local context, then we go ahead with uh, use, uh, user acceptance testing. And uh, we allow users to test the system and provide their feedback. So based on the feedback, uh, if anything needs to be changed, so we are really happy to do that. Um, so we have our dedicated uh, engineering te teams in place uh, to provide, uh, to incorporate those feedbacks. And um, after incorporating those uh, UAT feedbacks and uh, further customizing the solution, then we go to the uh, training of trainers. Uh, so we train um, government uh, trainers uh, to go and implement the solution. Uh, then we conduct uh, user training uh, then um, we go for the implementation uh, and we are uh, making the software live. And uh, once the software is live, uh, other thing is we are providing level one uh, support, level two and level three support. Uh, so level one is mainly uh, that you will have a, a support center in place uh, for uh, users to directly get contacted at any time um, and uh, if they're having any um, uh, concerns if they're having issues if they need any clarification they can get those uh, quick clarification from the uh, level one support set right. then we have level two support in place uh, in uh, provincial level where you have uh, provincial officers uh, uh, who can go and visit the locations and provide direct support. And then you have uh, level three support. Uh, this is where we have our development teams in place in our headquarters. Uh, when you have uh, new requirements, when you have uh, software bugs, uh, you can communicate those to uh, our level three support team. And um, then they will, uh, do the required modifications to the system um, to address uh, the needs of the users. Uh, so these are uh, some uh, uh, some of the pictures from our implementation in Nepal. 
Zimbabwe. Uh, and also this is, uh, these are some uh, pictures from our recent implementation, which is ongoing in uh, Philippines. Uh, so these are, our, like I mentioned, these are our three implementations in Nepal, Zimbabwe, and Philippines. Uh, so we have partnered with uh, USAID uh, Global Fund uh, in these projects. And we're supported by uh, UNDP, Chemonix, and uh, MSH. Um, also, I thought it's worth highlighting about uh, our support structure, which I explained earlier, because um, in this type of a mission critical solution, you need you definitely need support, and uh, you need that support uh, maybe very often, and and uh, and the lead time um, shouldn't be high. So that's why we have this sort of a support mechanism in place. Uh, so you have on-site teams and off-site teams. Uh, on-site teams is uh, uh, in the country where we implement the solution. So that's where you have users, uh, level one help desk support team and level two uh, pro provincial ELMS officers. So users can basically contact through emails. They can raise a ticket in our ticketing system or else they can have phone calls, text messages to deal with, uh, to communicate with uh, level one support team. Uh, so they, they will direct uh, these support uh, queries to level two support team. If they uh, decide uh, they want to go and visit uh, these users and provide direct support, or else if uh, that's a, a change request to develop a new uh, feature, or else if it's a software bug so that is getting communicated to our offshore team, which is based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, uh, in our headquarters. Um, and uh, our uh, support team uh, will work on those and uh, provide them uh, and address those requirements. To do that, uh, we have a dedicated uh, support team in place. Um, so that's where we add a lot of value. Uh, so we have uh, a support manager, software architect, um, software development team lead, business analysts, software developers, quality assurance engineers, uh, then uh, business intelligence analysts and business intelligence developers uh, in place uh, with this team. Um, who are specifically looking at uh, uh, software bugs, uh, then looking at uh, new requirements. Um, and, and that's why we've been able to uh, address any uh, concerns or the new features uh, requirements uh, uh, within a um, shorter lead time. Yeah, so, um, um, so about uh, intuition Vesta ELMI solution. So this is a solution we have implemented in three countries. So it's a, a proven and tested solution. Um, and also, uh, it's not program specific. Uh, you can implement the solution for any uh, program like uh, uh, maternity child health, like family planning, uh, then for TB, malaria. So in a, using a single system, you can address uh, multiple programs. And uh, also we have features for pharmaceutical drug management, then laboratory and uh, API uh, management. So Nishka, and, uh, I, I don't mean I don't mean to interrupt, but we have ten minutes left, and there's a few questions that have come in on Slack. So I think Suganya, you can also reply directly in Slack, or if you want to take these, uh, just so you know that to manage your time, if you want to take these in plenary. But back over to you. Sure, thank you. So I mean, um, the last slide. Um, so I, uh, I can take on the questions afterwards. Um, so we have a 24 seven dedicated uh, support team, uh, like I explained earlier. And also I wanted to highlight uh, the solution can be hosted on premise uh, based on uh, country specific uh, policies which in place, or else you can host in um, Azure or AWS. 
the best thing is we have a very uh, experienced, uh, uh, globally experienced team uh, with us who can go and uh, identify the requirements and implement the solution uh, uh, in the countries. Um, yeah, so uh, so I have, we have come to uh, the end of the presentation, and also I thought it's worth highlighting about our uh, uh, the numerous solution, which is the control tower, uh, which captures data from uh, ELMS systems and different other systems, and uh, which can provide functionalities relating to demand forecast, procurement, transportation management, order tracking, and um, uh, for services. Um, yeah, so these were the things um, we wanted to highlight in uh, today's demonstration um, within, within the shorter time period uh, uh, we have. Uh, yeah, so I would like to take any questions uh, you have. Thank you so much for that. That's really impressive. Uh, all of the features that your system uh, provides. That was really great to, to hear. If you could share the presentation, I can make it available to all of the participants. We have a, a shared folder where they can have access to that and then they can reach out to you directly. Um, there are a few questions that have come in. Maybe I can, uh, well, there are two of them. Uh, of course, DHS2 is an open source platform. And the first one question is, is if this is open source, and if it's available on GitHub from another one, it would be quite a comprehensive system. But if you can say something about the licensing, that would be great. Um, uh, yes, Bruno. Um, actually, uh, we're not open source, uh, and uh, we are a thought solution. Um, and uh, the thing is, uh, uh, but when we implement the solution, uh, we are sharing the source code uh, for the country for the sustainability, and also we train the teams uh, uh, within the health ministry uh, to take up the source code uh, at uh, any time they require. Or else, uh, like I mentioned you earlier, we have a dedicated team uh, who, is, uh, who are specifically supporting any um, new requirements, any software bugs. Uh, so you don't have to wait for a longer time to get things resolved. Uh, so that's why we have placed uh, dedicated teams um, uh, as level three support. Um, uh, yeah, we are a code solution uh, right now. Okay, that's great. And we work, uh, DHS2 works with uh, also private uh, uh, platforms and we have integrations with Oracle, ERP and others. So this is not some kind of requirement, but it's definitely a question we get being an open source software, it's one of the first things that is asked. There's another question also in the chat asking about the support. Is it all from Sri Lanka, from your, your headquarters, or do you also, what's the level of building local capacity and local support within the countries where you implement? Is that a requirement in any of these uh, three implementations you've had so far? Definitely, uh, because um, sustainability different uh, definitely depends on um, the local capacity building. Uh, so that's something we really value. Uh, that's why we always build a level one, level two support uh, in, in, with local capacity. So when it comes to level one support, the support center will always be placed in um, with uh, in, in that uh, the country that we're implementing the solution. Uh, there you will have a dedicated uh, support team uh, with support managers, support analysts. Uh, who can directly engage with uh, um, the local users. Then um, we train uh, level two support uh, officers. Uh, we call them ELMIS officers uh, who can go and visit the sites based on uh, the level one support center's requirements. Uh, so they can directly engage with users and they can provide any, um, do any configura uh, configuration level changes. And also they can train the users uh, and have a look on the issues they have. And um, if there's anything that they can't resolve and if it's relating to new feature development or any software bug related activity, then it comes to uh, level three support uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, but like I explained earlier, um, if the country wants to uh, have the source code and 
um, if they want to build uh, things around the source code, yes, that's uh, something that we allow. Um, and and um, then we can build the capacity uh, of the local uh, resources to provide even go and do the source code modifications and provide uh, L3 support. All right, that's great. Now I have a comment and three questions from Robert Moldy. He's been actually very active uh, throughout the week. Uh, very good questions, Robert. Uh, so first, Belid Intuition Vesta is definitely a comprehensive ELMIS with great UI and analytics. Use of AI machine learning is leading edge. That's his comment. And then he has three questions. So first question, from any past experience where it has been deployed as an LMIS, how easy or how long does it take for users to get up to speed with effective use? Second question, if a country took up Intuition Vesta for national LMIS and installed on-premise rather than cloud, would the system, what would be the system requirements? And then third, are the level one and level two support team locally recruited and developed? Are these posted or are these posted by Belita? Yeah, great questions. Um, about past experience um, uh, implementing the solution. Um, so we have implemented the solution in uh, Nepal, we have implemented the solution in Zimbabwe, and we have implemented the solution um, in Philippines, which is ongoing right now. Uh, so how easy and how long it takes to uh, implement a solution, it, it depends with uh, country's requirements. For an example, if you take um, the implementation in uh, Nepal, so it was our first implementation. It took, uh, it took actually uh, six months uh, uh, to implement the, the pilot locations. Uh, which, uh, then uh, if you go to Zimbabwe, it took less months and their requirements were not very complicated like uh, Nepal. For an example, in Nepal, um, we had to develop uh, the application with the local language. We had to have features because they're having a different calendar as well. They are in 2079, I think right now. So we had to develop different calendars um, to manage their financial years. Likewise, so there were a lot of very complicated um, requirements in the country. Um, so that's why it took six months. But if you take uh, Zimbabwe, uh, the, uh, the requirements they had were not very complicated. So it took like um, three to four months for the implementation. Uh, then if you take uh, Philippines, again, a bit of uh, complicated requirements. So it took uh, like six months uh, to uh, uh, have the pilot. Uh, so likewise, it depends with the, the requirement, but um, the, the basic requirements uh, you can uh, implement uh, uh, within uh, three months uh, timeline uh, after customizing the, the solution and uh, for the local uh, context. The best thing is, uh, most of the things we have in the solution, you don't need to do uh, code level modifications. You can basically start configuring uh, the organization hierarchy. And uh, then uh, we have a specific admin panel for the users to upload master data. Um, uh, uh, admins to upload master data and users to upload their uh, opening balances likewise. Uh, so we have built a lot of um, configurations around the system, uh, which allows to uh, up and run the system within a very short time uh, period. Uh, about uh, on-premise and system requirements, uh, yes, uh, we provide uh, the on-premise uh, capability. Um, if you take all three of our implementations, we have right now uh, all our on premise. Um, so in Nepal, they have a, uh, the system in uh, a local data center. In Zimbabwe, they have uh, a solution in uh, Ministry of Health. And even in the Philippines, they have it in uh, the Department of Health. Um, the requirements, again, it depends with uh, the, the number of uh, users uh, you have. Uh, so you don't have need to have uh, uh, like uh, you only the thing you need to have is you need to have uh, the internet connection if you are using our uh, web-based application or else we can uh, provide you a, a kind of a VPN connectivity. Uh, depends with the infrastructure you have right now in the country uh, or else if you're using our 
offline applications. Uh, uh, you need to uh, go to a specific location just to synchronize data uh, on a weekly, monthly basis. Uh, otherwise, you can start using the, the solution and start uh, creating the transactions. Uh, when you want to synchronize and report the data, uh, you'll need uh, internet connection. Uh, about- I can just stop you one second, Anushka, because uh, we're, we're at time at 14. So I just want to say thank you to the participants who have to leave for a follow-up meeting. I want to just respect the time. So the word of the day for the attendance is Red Rock, and we will meet back then tomorrow online at 10 a.m. Oslo time to continue with day four. Okay, so thank you to everybody who has to leave now, but we can go back to you now, Danushka, just to continue and, and hear the answer to the third point on the local or, or remote support. And we also have a, a couple more questions that we can we can uh, come with if you still have the time to stay with us. So back to you, Danushka. Definitely. Um, um, so regarding level one and level two support, uh, mostly what we do is we uh, always encourage uh, uh, the health ministry uh, to uh, provide their resources to build capacity around them for level one and level two support, or else if they don't have enough resources, uh, we encourage them to go and partner with a local company in the country, and then we build uh, capacity um, uh, in, in local resources. So always uh, in all of our implementations, uh, level one and level two support, uh, we have done with uh, local resources. Uh, we have trained them um, uh, starting from the beginning of the uh, implementation. So what we do is we, when we normally go to a country, um, first we are trying to establish uh, these level one and level two support teams and they will get trained um, start from the beginning and they will be engaged uh, in the project start from the beginning. So when we go to the implementation stage, then um, they are uh, up to the level where they can uh, provide a level one and level two support. Uh, so we conduct specific trainings uh, targeting level one and level two, and also they will be part of our UAT as well as they will be part of our TOTs and uh, user training sessions. So. Then once we go to the, the implementation stage, uh, they are already uh, connected with the users and, and they, are, they are already knowing the system to provide uh, better support. All right, thank you for that. I wrote a uh, summary uh, in writing in the Slack in the channel, uh, just so that's captured, there was a lot of information. I have another question from then George McGuire asking, in what countries is the mobile app used at the facility level for stock management? Yeah, um, right now, uh, the mobile application is uh, used in uh, Nepal. Uh, and uh, so there is, uh, when we go to the second stage in uh, Zimbabwe, they also, they are going to have uh, the mobile uh, application for uh, transaction-based mobile application. Right now it's in a post because of the, uh, the pandemic, but I think hopefully uh, things will um, start uh, 2023 and uh, Philippines, they are going to use uh, our LMIS data capturing mobile application uh, until they make all sites uh, fully live. Uh, that means one, uh, until they make, um, until all sites start using our uh, uh, web-based uh, transaction application. Okay, thank you for that. And then I have a final question from Abdul Qadir Hassan Abdi, who asks if you have any plans to implement your ELMIS in Somalia. A very specific question. <laughs> yeah, definitely, that's something uh, we would like uh, really like to discuss uh, and and see um, uh, what are the requirements they have, and and we're really open for that. So we can definitely conduct a demonstration session of them and discuss with their um, health ministry to, ministries to see their specific needs and, and then we can uh, take it forward uh, from there. That's something we would really like to have. All right, thank you. 
we have a hand from Robert. Go ahead, Robert. Uh, thank you, uh, Breno, and uh, uh, thank you, the presenter. Uh, I, there was just one question which I uh, which which I raised. Uh, there was that backward scanner which was in the video uh, that he demoed. Is it running as some kind of app that is developed by the company, or uh, it is that's not the case? Because I saw the user interface was looking familiar. Yeah, I think I just wanted to uh, seek that clarification. Yeah, good question. Um, actually, uh, we are providing the software. Uh, so that's a, a software built by our company. But the device, uh, we recommend certain devices uh, uh, which are compatible with our solution. Um, and and uh, you can imp uh, install uh, the, uh, the software. Uh, basically, it's an Android uh, application. You can install the software in the device. Uh, and uh, then uh, you can uh, get the features relating to barcode scanning, et cetera. So we mainly provide the, the software solution, but uh, you can uh, procure the devices uh, and we recommend uh, the devices. All right, I think that more or less covers all of the questions that we had coming in. I think, um, that was a very impressive uh, presentation. A lot of uh, uh, good and complete features uh, that you have in your system. Uh, unless there's any more comments, I don't see any more hands. I don't see any more hands here, but uh, yeah, Danushka, if you have any final comments to, to, to the group, uh, we would otherwise like to thank you for your time and for presenting and uh, we'll definitely continue to be in touch, but uh, over to you again. Thanks, Bruno, and uh, we, uh, we are really thankful for DHS2 Academy and for you uh, for providing this opportunity uh, for us to present our solution. Uh, and and uh, we are also uh, really looking forward to engage with DHIS2. Uh, and and um, like I have seen, you have a very good uh, application, mobile application, which can capture data at service security points. So if you are already, uh, if any of the countries are already having the infrastructure in place for DHIS2, definitely they can start using that um, solution and uh, then they can, uh, they want uh, uh, fully fledged uh, capabilities uh, in uh, ELMIS, uh, then you can switch to uh, any of the other vendors uh, to get the, the full uh, functionalities. Um, and and uh, we're really uh, happy to work with uh, DHS2. And uh, also we would like to thank everyone uh, who in this session today, and there were a lot of good questions and, and interest. Uh, and we are really looking forward to uh, work with you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right, thank you again, Danushka. Thank you, Suganya, who we've also been in touch with. Um, and yeah, uh, feel free to reach out to the Belita team. If you can share the presentation, I'll make it available to all the participants, and we definitely look forward to being in touch. We'll touch a bit more on the uh, aspects of assessment and seeing what's the, the best solution and what's the best option for the country on the Friday morning session again. And then again, it comes into what are you trying to achieve? Where are you trying to, to bring your, your system? And uh, with our approach being uh, making use of existing infrastructure where it's available, and again, depending on a dedicated ELMIS to manage your supply chain from a central level uh, down to where you can connect to this DHS2 data where it's available. Uh, but again, um, thank you, and we'll be uh, we'll be in touch. For the participants, we'll connect tomorrow again at 10 a.m. and continue then on day four of the LMIS Academy. Thanks everybody who stayed over time, and we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>